Maybe we could start just with a little bit of quiet sitting to arrive. Just <coughs> sitting in a relaxed, easy way. Um, letting your skeleton hold your weight. And focus your attention on the movement of the breath coming in and out gently at the nostrils. And whenever the mind wanders off, you just gently bring your attention back to that focus so that uh, we don't get perturbed about where we go, wandering after thoughts. We're not strongly trying to force the mind, but just to start to collaborate with ourselves on the task of being present. bit of time here this weekend to look together at the nature of change um, in relation to mainstream Buddhist understanding. Uh, one of the things I think one can quickly see uh, when we do this quiet sitting practice is that our minds are not very quiet. That thoughts, feelings, sensations are always moving. This is very important because when we're just in the movement of activity in our lives, the very <laughs> dynamic nature of our interaction often gives a sense of continuity. Because we think, I'm just leading my life, I'm doing this, then I'm going to do that, then I'm going to do that. And the clarity of my intention to be doing many different things gives me a strong sense of I am this fixed, enduring person who sometimes does this, sometimes does that. But when we sit in the meditation, we become aware that many thoughts and feelings are moving. This movement is the basis of our existence. Change is essentially what we are. So in Buddhism, there's a lot of... Uh, writing and discussion about impermanence. That when we see the phenomena of the world, houses, cars, other people, and when we see ourselves as something fixed, predictable, reliable, this creates a kind of comfort, a kind of sense of being in control, being an agent, being an adult who knows what's what, how things work. And yet, there's perhaps something rather deluding in that, because maybe it's not really like that. For example, I've been coming to Macclesfield for a few years now. When I first came, we were in another building, then we were in a building in the park, then we came to this new building. There was the excitement of setting it up, all freshly painted, gradually new things were brought to the altar. And now the altar is being dismantled, and this center is vanishing. That's what happens. Everything is created out of causes and circumstances. And when these causes and circumstances change, what they have manifested will change as well. Seeing the process, the movement of existence, and seeing that we also have the same nature, that somebody speaks to us in a sweet way and we feel good, somebody's a bit critical to us or not very friendly and we shrink inside, we see that we also are in this interdependence with the environment. That is to say, what I am, how I am, who I think I am, is not something internally defined from some self-existing essence that is truly me, but is actually a, a changing, moving way of presenting myself with others. Sometimes this can feel a bit scary, because actually who I am is then 
co-created with other people. I am the world I inhabit. And the world I inhabit is revealed to me by how I am. So, people are interested in different things. For children, the idea that the snow is coming is very exciting. For older people who are worried about slipping and breaking their hip, the snow <coughs> is not very exciting. So, our own position brings a coloration or a flavor to the field of experience that we operate in. And what we experience then influences how we react to things. So this pulsation between what appears to be outside us and what appears to be inside us is going on all the time. We can't stabilize a fixity of external environment or a fixity of internal environment. From the Buddhist point of view, this is liberating. It's liberating because it frees us from the illusion that we should somehow be able to live life on our terms. And that if we can't fulfill the hopes and dreams that we have, that we are then somehow a kind of failure. That I should be stronger, I should be more brave, I should work hard. And if only I did that, if only I really pushed a bit more, my life would be just the way I wanted. So somehow the fantasy that life could be secure ends up as a basis for a criticism of our own capacity. Whereas in fact, we are part of the world that unfolds. And that is determined by many, many different factors, very few of which are in the palm of our hand. This, if we accept it, if we see it, can give us the kind of humility which allows much more flexibility. Rather than pushing against circumstances, we can start to really collaborate with them and find a way of inhabiting our existence however it is. This is the, the real uh, Buddhist notion of not wasting energy. You think how many things which human beings do are a struggle against forces. For example, in Afghanistan, every now and then, General Petraeus says, well, eventually we're going to have to talk to the Taliban. Eventually we're going to have to talk to people in Al-Qaeda. Of course. Of course. You know, in the Second World War, the idea of talking with the Germans would be very bad. If you did that, you would be seen as betraying the nation. Then after the Second World War, it becomes quite important to speak to the Germans because you can do some trade with them. All conflict situations are circumstantial. Today's enemy can be tomorrow's friend, and so on. So the idea that somehow, by really trying very, very hard, we can make things happen, is to forget that our lives exist in time. And in time, what appears in one form will transform and appear in another form. So, these um, Celtic tigers, this wonderful e economy that was developing in Ireland, that was transforming people's lives. Every week, 10 new millionaires. No, it's in a mess. No. Hopes expand, then fears contract. This pulsation goes on through time, everywhere in the world. When we think it shouldn't be happening, if only we could identify who the bad guys are and lock them up or shoot them, then our lives would be well. This has happened many times. You find out who the real enemy is and you try to annihilate them, but it doesn't work. Because good people do bad things and bad people do good things. Life is more complicated than we would like it to be, which is why the fantasy of control is overrated. Of course, if you're driving a car, you have to control it so you don't crash. But in general, the best principle is collaboration. That is to say, to experience how the environment around you is moving, and then to move with that. So that the labore, the work, 
of the other, the activity of the other, and your own activity or movement or manifestation come into a harmony and you have a, as much synergy as possible. This is the basis of the Buddhist inquiry into what is it that inhibits me and restricts me so that I can't work with circumstances? What are the fixed positions that I take up? You could see these in terms of a neurosis, that you might have a tendency to anxiety or depression. You might have a belief about yourself, well, I'm just not that kind of person. We all have certain ideas about our own personal identity, and these ideas then become a limit to the manifestation of our potential to be many different people. And as the years go by in our lives, we look back and we maybe think, oh, I missed that opportunity. I could have done that. And I didn't do it because I felt it wasn't possible for me. So what is the status of that thought, I can't, or that's not me? It's a definition. It's an idea that we sit inside and which in some ways seems to be comforting because it reassures us that we know who we are. And yet, that very definition is also a restriction. A restriction which can prevent us from exploring all the other things we might be. In Buddhism, this is opened up and discussed under the idea that there is an absence of inherent self-nature in phenomena and in people. That is to say, what I call myself is a series of propositions. It's a kind of narrative. And that narrative creates the illusion that there is some true essence inside me. But that essence has been created by circumstances. You grow up in a family or in an institution, and there are messages that you get all the time about how you are, what you're entitled to do, what your place in the world is. Gradually that gets internalized. We start to believe the messages that people say about us. And sometimes we reject them very strongly. But even that rejection is a positioning that stands in relation to the messages that were given to us. So resistance just as much as compliance means that we take up a, a, a fixity, a closing down of who we are. And then, of course, other people start to read us as being like this or like that, because we try to make sense of the people around us. We try to work out what they're like, what they're not like. And that's you know, the experiences we have in childhood, working out friendships, and then the friendship collapses, and you feel happy, and that then gives you a sense of, well, I have to be a bit more careful. And gradually, we work out these DIY strategies of protecting and maintaining ourselves. And often, these are never reviewed. Building up a profile of who I am, building up a sense of how the world is and how it works. And although we can see that other people don't live in the same way as we do, other people seem to be able to do things that we can't do. We, the, conclusion, the conclusion we usually make is, oh, that's because I'm not like them. They can do it because they're not like me. So what is this innate difference between people? It's, from the Buddhist point of view, it's not innate at all. It's something developed due to the causes and conditions of childhood development. The habituation of a kind of constraint then becomes normal. Just as on an outer level, if somebody smokes 20 cigarettes a day for 30 years, smoking cigarettes is their normal thing. They wake up in the morning, the first thing they do is they light a fag. They might even have that cigarette in bed because it's just it's what they do. It becomes part and parcel of their way of life, something that they don't often want to reflect on. It's, it's built in to their profile. In the same way, being a bit depressed, being anxious, being rather frightened, being very gregarious, all the various ways that people are, 
are habitual formations. These habitual formations have no particular inherent truth inside them. They are contingent. They depend on circumstances. And yet, when we are under the power of them, they seem to be absolutely valid. This is how I am. So part of exploring the nature of change is to see that the more attached we are to these developed positions, the more difficult they are to change. That is to say, it is my own identification with a position that gives it its strength, its solidity, its gravity. I am the one who is telling myself that I am like that. Other people may be doing that as well. But these are stories. These are ideas. And on the basis of the internalization of that idea, I come to appear to be like this. Then the story changes. So, this building was started by ideas. These ideas manifested in the activity of people. Some people have put hundreds and hundreds of hours of work into getting this place the way it is, building it up, having meetings and so on. When the field in which that activity is occurring changes, the activity can no longer manifest. What is the change in the field? It's a change in ideas. Somebody who was committed to something now becomes less committed to it. When they become less committed to it, other people become a bit uh, confused about what's going on. That confusion leads to different kinds of thoughts, and gradually there's a dissolution of the energy which was holding things in place, and then you have a change. So the idea generates a mood, out of the mood flows the activity, out of the activity comes the building up of a structure, or the packing down again of the structure. When the structure was here, it was as if it, this is what it is. Here's the Dharma center, people come and do things. But it had a beginning, and like all compounded things, it's going to have an end. It can reform itself in other environments, taking new directions and so on. But the essential point to see is the nature of the investment in the idea. If people don't invest in the idea, it won't happen. If you invest too much in the idea, you can start to believe that having made it happen, we now have to maintain it. And you then become a prisoner of the construction. So that the dynamic movement between believing in something, which releases the energy to invest in it and, and make it real for yourself, is not going to fix anything in time. It will always be a process of participation. There is nothing fixed and reliable anywhere. This doesn't mean that it's all just rubbish, so why bother? It means to develop a likeness of participation. If you can't come into the world, nothing of value is going to arise. If you go into the world too, in too heavy a way, you're trying to grasp and hold on and fix things. And so you become the caretaker. You come to be the one who's looking after things. And of course, caretakers can get careworn because there's always something to worry about. So the middle way, which is at the heart of all the Buddhist ideas, is how to be open to participation, but participation with the sense of yourself as fluid, moving and changing, in an environment which is fluid, moving and changing. That is to say, the meaning of the participation 
has to be primarily the quality of the present that it engenders. That is to say, if the work is skillfully done, it should be okay to do it. It's always a bad sign in an organization when the organizers get to a point where they don't want to see each other anymore and that having meetings is just kind of boring or anxiety provoking or so on. Because what that tends to mean is, oh, well, we have to do this in order to get there. That somewhere over the rainbow there's a happy land, and if only we push harder and have these horrible, ghastly encounters with each other, something marvelous is going to come out of it. That's really not how it's a very good way to live. At the heart of it is enjoyment. Because enjoyment is released for us, I think, in the moment in which we are fully present with others and able to be there. Not hiding parts of ourselves inside, not being half-hearted. And out of the, that quality of meeting together, something of value is likely to arise. The notion of sacrifice for the future is very, very unwise. Now the government's going to flog us this tired old horse again. It is disgraceful. I think as I told you sometimes before, when I was a child, my father often talked about that, that as a soldier coming back at the end of the Second World War, when they were having their demob, there was all this story, you know, a land fit for heroes, and how they were all going to be rewarded, and so on. And of course, when you leave the army and you go back into your civilian occupation, it's not like that, because the people who didn't go to war have secured the jobs, and they don't want to see any medals on your chest, and they don't want to hear anything about titles and so on, because you're back into another game. The time of sacrifice and the time of reward then become divided. The cause and the effect relationship is split. And this is, this is something very, very important to see. That being present means to be present with this environment. Now, if we are persecuted by our environment, what's going on? What is it that makes it impossible to fully inhabit our circumstances? Of course, very often, our circumstances are not the way we want. We might find that we've got physical illnesses, financial difficulties, people around us get sick and die, children behave in ways we're not happy about, and so on. It can often then appear that if only things were different, I would be happier. What is actually happening is an impediment to the fulfillment of my existence. What does that mean? It's very understandable. We, we can all feel like that. But there's something a bit strange in it, isn't there? That I am this special kind of orchid that can only blossom when there are particular conditions. And if I'm removed from the hothouse in Kew Gardens, I'm going to fall over. That's a very fragile way of existing, isn't it? Our life is what we get. This is it. You can't trade it in somewhere for something else. This is it. It doesn't matter what lands on someone else's plate. What we get is the unique specificity, specificity of our embodied existence with what happens in the body, in our thoughts, feelings, and in the environment around us. So, returning to the notion of impermanence, the more we can see that the constraints in our movement are ones which we repeat. That is to say, in the openness of the unformed situation, we bring in the factors that determine who we are and what we can do and what we can't do. And that then largely constrains what's possible for us. So, Part of the function of meditation is to start to examine what are the building blocks of my sense of self and my sense of the world. Well, in Buddhist philosophy, there are a lot of different ideas and methods of doing this. But the central point is to start to observe oneself 
and one's world, because our self and our world are not two different things. How do we ha behave with different kinds of people? Who brings out the best in us? Who seems to bring out the worst in us? To observe that means not to judge it, not to, because judgment is always a solidifying quality. It locks you back into a particular fixed reading. But rather just to observe, how is it that I can be warm and friendly to some people and not so warm and friendly to other people? What, what are the particular triggers and hooks that bring about that aspect of mind coming out here but not coming out there? And then we start to see that it's not as if we have this factory or this source inside ourselves that's pumping ourselves out into the world, but that we are emerging with the environment. So the external trigger and the internal pattern lock on. It's very difficult to transform all the external triggers. So from the point of view of practice, being more clear what the internal patterns are is helpful. And then we have to start to examine what is the nature of attachment. What is it that creates the felt sense of inevitability in a thought or a feeling that's arising for us? So again, to take a crude external example, if somebody is very habituated to smoking cigarettes, the thought that they need a cigarette is usually a thought that has no contradiction. There's no internal contradiction because they smoke. They are a smoker. So the arising of the impulse to reach for the packet is so habituated, so unconscious, that they're already lighting the cigarette before they know they do. It's just a seamless movement. Internally, it's much the same. If people have a habit of becoming angry or critical or conflictual in their relations or placatory, the one who's always offering generously to do things for others, these patterns arise and flow through us. And because they seem so natural, because they're refined as being who we are, what would the reason be for in any way standing in contradiction to them. Why would we do that? Because it's just us. So starting to observe ourselves can be quite difficult because it's not as if something's happening and you suddenly think, oh, what was that? Like maybe a car suddenly toots its horn and you oh, what's that? Something disrupts the continuity of one's existence you therefore see it because there's a kind of clash or conflict with our habits because they're arising through us as us. How are you going to see them? This is one of the reasons for doing meditation practice. To gradually have the experience that you and your experience or, or the, the experiencer and the content of experience are not the same because most of the time they're fused together. I'm angry. That is to say the subject, the experience of the anger and the feeling tone of the arising anger are merged together as a self-statement. I'm angry, I'm tired, I'm thirsty. They're often making these statements, they make sense to other people. You can all understand it when someone says it. There is a full identification with what is happening. So when we do this uh, basic um, calming practice of observing the, the focus of the breath or fixing on an external object, we start to get a bit of space in which we can observe more neutrally the one who is uh, aware or attentive what it is that's being attended to, that is to say, I am attending to the breath. And now there are these other things, these thoughts. And the thought comes and carries me away. So despite having my conscious intention to focus on the breath, I find myself 
under the power of that thought or feeling. It is as if I'm carried off. That's very, very interesting. It demonstrates our powerlessness, which is quite helpful. If Mr. Obama could do some of this, this would be very helpful for us. Because it's the idea of being <laughs> rational which is so alarmingly dangerous. Buddhism and psychoanalysis are agreed in the proposition that human beings are not rational. The ego thinks it is rational. We think we know what we're doing. That is what makes us very, very dangerous. Because when we think what we're doing, we're usually running a habitual interpretation. And inside that habitual interpretation, it makes sense. But it may well be a closed world. For example, a lot of money is now going into Ireland. And it will be used to shore up the uh, government bonds that secure the possibility of paying back. However, these bonds are out on the open market. That is to say, speculators can start to move these, these bonds around. They can buy up a whole lot and sell them off quickly and so on. And they can bet on the price going up or the price going down. So bringing down the Irish economy is a way for a few people to become very rich. It's been done before. Remember Soros did it to the British pound. To all the people working hard and who are going to have less pension and who are going to have less pay, all of that individual human endeavor that people make a sacrifice for the future of their country and so on can just be wiped out because a few people want to make money. And these people making money won't see themselves as cruel, as unkind, because they're living inside the bubble of, my job is to make money. This is a way of making money, so I make money. Make money, retire at 40, why not? The fact that it has enormous consequences on other people, is very difficult. The American government, the British government, <coughs> None of them. the German government, the French government, none of these governments have in any way punished the banks. We've bailed out the banks. Well, who gets punished? The other people. Because it's very difficult to see cause and effect. And then you're told, well, if you try to punish the bankers, they'll all leave. They'll go and operate from Switzerland or some other place. That, that is very, very interesting, isn't it? Because that says fundamentally the world economic market that we're all absolutely connected with is unethical. Absolutely unethical. The ethical basis of our existence is collapsing. The metaphysical basis is collapsing. What we have now is this kind of castrated pragmatism where everybody's just up for themselves. That is really quite frightening. Because what are the bonds of humanity that would link people when people can collapse another person's eco entire economy for the sake of early retirement? As if an action has no consequence. All the religions in the world teach the link between cause and effect. They may teach it in a way that doesn't fit people's ideas nowadays. They may say, well, if you do bad things, you'll go to hell when you die. Not many people want to entertain that idea now. But it speaks of the idea that you can't get away with it. And the more, <coughs> the more you get into uh, a mental system that says, I can get away with it, nobody can catch me. Why, why would we bother being kind? It's a sort of carrot and stick thing, isn't it? If you're bad, you go to hell. If you're good, you go to heaven. Stick and carrot. Reasonably effective. Mainly for donkeys, but nowadays we th we're all very convinced that we're not donkeys. So we don't want any sticks. And we want different kinds of carrots. We want our carrot in our hand munching it now. What this means is that the understanding of impermanence becomes falsified to, into a very short-term reading, you can get away with it. Now, we probably know in our own lives 
that sometimes we've lived in that way, getting away with it. You know, somehow you manage to get through an exam at school and you haven't studied very well for it and you, you sort of scam it a bit. Everybody hustles a little bit to survive. That works a little bit in life. But if you have too much of it, there's a kind of ungroundedness that goes with it. Because there's no clarity about the structure through which the world manifests itself. Part of reflecting and observing ourselves in seeing what we are up to is we have to look, what is the ethical dimension of our existence? What do other people mean for us? That is to say, if I live in a world of one, then all of you are just other people. How you are has nothing much to do with me. Because I have my life and you have your life. What if I experience that my world is inhabited by you, then what happens to you is extremely important to me. Because you are my world. I don't have any other world. Wherever we go, there are other people. We don't live just in ourselves. Because even if you lived alone in a flat and you didn't talk to people, you probably watch television or you listen to the radio and you certainly wear clothes you didn't make yourself, you eat food you didn't make yourself. That we are constantly in interaction with other people. And if that interaction is denied by us through a very self-referential interpretation, we can end up with a, a, an alienated sense of your situation has nothing to do with me. Why should I? Why should I be kind? Why should I be thoughtful? What's in it for me? This is, this is very, very prevalent nowadays. And, and from a Buddhist point of view, I think from the human heart point of view, it's very debased. How, how could life be rich and deep in a world of one? The fact that other people suffer touches us. There's something painful in seeing children crying in the street. It's upsetting. You think, oh, that shouldn't happen. What would the reason be? In that way, there's a, a reaching out to say, I know you. I have a connection with you. The struggle to maintain that in the face of this uh, urban alienation that is fairly pervasive is, is a great struggle. And from the Buddhist point of view, it's a very necessary struggle because the movement towards awakening is grounded in the understanding of non-duality. That is to say, there are no fixed entities. How, what we experience stands in relation to our own existence. For example, <coughs> this building here, when <coughs> it was first moved into, didn't have the walls painted in this way. These walls are painted in these Buddhist colors because Buddhist people thought to get this uh, center uh, very kindly provided by a good sponsor and to make it more Buddhist. So how do you make a room more Buddhist? You paint it in these sort of colors. And then people think, oh, this is now a Buddhist center. Why is it a Buddhist center? Because it's got colors and stuff on an altar. In that way, what is inside the intention and what is outside start to move together. If another group had taken this over, they might want very clear white walls. They might have put their energy into different kind of environments. They might have had lots of yoga mats or whatever on the floor. What's in my head and what's in my world are intimately connected. Our thoughts are about the world. The world is the field in which we move. That is to say, fundamentally, there is no inner life. A lot of spiritual thinking is concerned with the inner life, deepening the inner life. Theosophical writings, 
to some transpersonal psychology, a lot of Jung's writing is concerned with this, as if there was a world inside me and a world outside me. I don't think this is actually true, that what we call inner and outer are interacting all the time. It's one field of experience. For example, uh, how my body is will influence how I'm speaking with you. So if I'm tired, if my back's sore, I would be less available. If I'm feeling relaxed and happy, I'm going to be more available. That's pretty obvious. So it's not that something is inside, it's that the conditions arise together there's a co-emergence, a simultaneity of the out and the in. Outside and inside are only names. We say this is inside. We say this is outside. People will define what, what the boundary is between inside and outside very differently. Some people are, as we say, very private people. They keep a lot of themselves inside. And the idea of communicating or sharing their private life with other people fills them with a kind of anxiety or horror. Other people very much like to be connected. They enjoy sharing. They, they, they show themselves a lot. The private person, if you uh, observe them closely, you can probably see quite a lot of what's going on inside. Because it's very difficult to hide. We, we reveal ourselves by the quality of our eyes, the lines around our eyes, around our mouths, our gesture and posture. We can see if somebody's shy or anxious or angry or whatever it is. Embodied existence is revealing what? Revealing participation. I think this is quite an important point because you could read so you look at someone's face and they look a bit depressed. You could read that depression as something inside them. You are depressed. And you could think maybe I should encourage them to go to their GP and they can get some medication. And the, the medication will act on their brain and help to shift their mood. That's one reading. But they're, they're depressed in the world. You can read them as being depressed in themselves, but actually they're depressed in the world. Their depression is their way of being in the world with others. It is their mode of participation at that particular period of time. If you see it in that way, then you might approach it in a very different way. That the way of shifting the depression is to alter the field factors rather than looking for something inside the person. You could look at a family systems reading. You could look at the economic situation. So rather than essentializing the problem as something located in some true definition of who the person is, one can see it as a mood which is arising due to causes and circumstances and is manifesting briefly in that form for a while. If we do that, then we have a much more relational world in which we have an entitlement to participate in the actual situation of the other. That's the essence of what non-duality means, is that there are not two things. There's not one category of good, one category of bad. There's not male and female. There's not inside and outside. These are interpretations. These are concepts. We live in a world mediated by concepts. But understanding how, how we use concepts as tools of connection with other people, as part of our participation, or using them as definitional tools for securing my certainty my sense of this is what it is, I know where I am, that's very, very different, isn't that? One is seeing how we arrive at being in the world with others. 
for example, the Austrian philosopher Wittgenstein always said, if you want to understand a word, don't look in a dictionary, see how it's used. If we want to understand people, see how they are, be with them as they are, and they will reveal themselves. But if you try to define someone, if you give them a diagnosis, or if you know about them, then you put them inside a box, and then it gets more and more solid. And we've seen how these kind of prejudicial readings have uh, greatly reduced the freedom of many, many people in the world. Each, from the Buddhist point of view, each person has Buddha nature. That is to say, an infinite potential to manifest in many ways. That Buddha nature is um, explored in two particular aspects. One is wisdom, one is compassion. Wisdom is to see that at the root of ourselves, the very essence or heart quality of the Buddha nature is that there's nothing there at all. The Buddha nature is essentially the, the absence of the possibility of catching anything. We are non-appropriatable. If you look to find your true self, you won't find anything. That doesn't mean that you don't exist. The other side is compassion, which is to observe how you become who you are moment by moment with others. Because the more connected your manifestation is with other people, the more helpful you can be, the more finely attuned you are to the environment as it is. So emptiness and compassion go together. It is the very fact that we are not a thing, we are not a particular entity, that allows us to be available for other people. And we've probably all experienced times in our lives when we've closed down, when we feel we've had enough, when we can't really cope. And in these moments, our life get quite small, and we don't want to answer the phone. We maybe don't want to open our letters. We just want to say, leave me alone. I've had enough. That's very, very interesting, because when you look at yourself in that moment, the tightening of that situation is largely definitional. This has happened. I don't like this. I can't bear this. We are telling ourselves a story that says the only way I can survive is cutting off. The world is my enemy. I've had enough. That is a story. Because actually, in the world. Some people endure much, much more than we do. How do they do that? By not over-determining a moment as a limit. Well, it's amazing when you see some of these soldiers coming back and they've had their legs cut off, and then a few months later they've got these incredible new metal legs that are bouncing along and they're looking forward to getting into the Paralympics. And others are not. Others are thinking, I don't want to go out of the house. I don't want anyone to see me like this. But what is that difference? Somebody is able to say, this has happened. This is who I am. What will I do? What's the relation between the world and me as a person with two metal legs? And someone else is saying, I know what the world's like. I've lost my world. I don't want this new world. Leave me alone. And one can have a lot of sympathy for people in that second position. But we can see how tragic it is. And probably it's something that we do in various ways. That's where you see the absolute limit. I cannot transcend this belief about myself. I just couldn't do it because it would be too embarrassing, too shaming. I'd feel awful. People would be looking at me. There's an internal dialogue which is sealing our world into something very, very small. The other possibility is to say, well, let's see what happens, see how I get on. That's essentially what we mean by observing. Let's see, let's see what goes on. Because the more we predict on the basis of the past map, the 
more we're likely to shrink ourselves because the past map was probably very accurate in the past, but it's probably not very accurate in the present, especially if something radical happens like a bereavement, being made redundant, having a sickness. We're now in a new world. How will I live? Well, we have to find out what the new world is. <coughs> Rather than seeking out a micro-environment which reaffirms us in the continuity of how we were before. So change involves being flexibly present in the world as it is. That is to say, a willingness to examine what my assumptions, my map is, and to redraw it. That's quite hard. Because what will I be standing on? What is the ground of my existence in that moment? What can I believe in? It's a big question, isn't it? Because if you, if you locate your sense of identity in familiar stories about yourself, and then the world changes, you're going to have to not just deal with the shifts in the external world, but you're going to have to give up the very basis that you've been thinking who you were on. This is the, the, the meaning of attachment in Buddhism. It doesn't mean being attached to special um, possessions like golf clubs or a motor car. It means identifying with the current structures of one's existence as if they were reliable and enduring and definitional of who I am. Rather, whatever we think we are, that is a work in progress. And these ideas are useful to, for helping to, to explore and illuminate the terrain that we find ourselves in, if it's based on observation. But if it's based on assumption, uh, it's much more difficult to revise. So the person who assumes, I am a smoker, when they take the cigarette out of the packet and it says on the front, this will kill you, that's irrelevant because I'm a smoker. That is to say, the information coming from the world about my activity will not impinge on my activity because my activity is grounded in an assumption that this is who I am and this is what I do. No? And I think we can see that operating in many areas of our lives, that it's the identification with assumptions, with fixed beliefs built up through time in our family, in schools, in occupations, in our religious beliefs and so on, that create a kind of little island that we stand on and that seems to be solid ground. And then as external factors shift, the real question is, will we look at our beliefs and see whether they are true or not? What do we understand? That's why being in this building is useful. What can we understand from the closing of a Buddha center? What can we understand by something dissolving? Maybe it will take on new forms. There's some chance of that. But certainly this and the energy that was behind the, the development of this is going. Does that matter? Is it a mistake? Did something go wrong? If we take the judgment out of it and just try to observe, it arose due to a changing field of causes and circumstances. People behaved in one way, then their behavior changed, then that <coughs> brought about changes in other people's behavior. And you get a, a moving field in which actual behavior and the map started to diverge. Yeah? So people would say, yes, we really want this to work. But the actual activity required to make it work was not occurring. And that's very interesting. It's 
if we could actually say, hang on a minute, what are we doing? What we're doing is creating the conditions in which this is not going to work. Is that really what we want to be doing? That might have opened up some other possibilities. So it's very helpful to see we can be operating under one set of assumptions. We can be flying under one flag and are convinced this is what I'm doing. And yet, the consequences of our actions do something else. The Buddha said very clearly, everywhere sentient beings want to be happy, but their behavior creates the conditions for their own unhappiness. So that's that's why meditation and analytical reflection on what we're up to is so important. Because if we can't see the divergence between the movement of our behavior and the stasis, the, the static quality of our beliefs, then we, we delude ourselves in imagining that we're doing something that we're not. So on that happy note, perhaps I'll have a cup of tea. <laughs> If the sun's too bright, you can pull down the blind a bit. Yeah. Okay. So, one of the important functions in thinking about impermanence <coughs> is to correct our relationship with time. We all know that when the past is gone, it's gone. We all know that the future hasn't come and nobody can predict how it's going to be. And yet, we often act as if that wasn't the case. We're often living half in the past and half in the future. So to <coughs> really see impermanence, we have to observe the particular details of our life moment by moment. For example, the sun is shining now. Some people have been here in the summertime. And when the sun shines in the summer, it creates a lot more warmth than the winter sun. The winter sun is hot if you're standing directly in it but it doesn't really warm the air enough. So if you go behind a building, you're suddenly in this cold draft of air. Winter and summer are not the same. Last summer is gone. We're now moving into winter. We don't know if we'll see another spring. None of us know how long we're going to live. <coughs> this is the absolute nature of our existence. People die in many, many different ways in car accidents, from diseases, in domestic disputes, through overdoses, and so on, through suicides, many, many ways to die. <coughs> That's a fact. The past is really gone. What is it that remains of the past? Clearly certain traces, certain assumptions, certain beliefs, certain orientations. <clears throat> Where are they? If the past is gone, say for example somebody had a difficult childhood, <clears throat> a difficult relation say with their mother and they didn't feel very loved. 
and it's made them feel not quite secure in themselves. The experience of the past has left a trace inside the psyche of that person. It's a kind of orientation. But where is it? It's only functioning if we go with it. That is to say, when the, the sensation of aversion, of avoiding a situation, of stepping back from people, because I'm not quite sure if I can trust them, when that arises, it's arising now, what is its truth? Who are these people who I'm avoiding? Well, I don't know, but I avoid people because I don't trust them. Well, which people don't we trust? Well, we don't trust the people who might be like the mother who didn't give us the care that we needed at that time. So we've gone from a particular situation to a generalized belief, which is then projected onto other people, in the light of which, in order to protect myself, I take up a position of being permanently wary. And that wariness becomes embedded just in my way of being, so that I step back rather than stepping forward, as it were, automatically. I'm sure we're familiar with that sort of structure, perhaps in ourselves or in people we know. What's particularly important is to think, well, where is this tendency embedded? If you go to psychotherapy, the therapist will be, you know, exploring the historical development of that particular kind of positioning and, and making bridges so that you realize how the present is suffused with these tendencies and structures from the past. Okay, but where are they? Because, <clears throat> say I'm going into a social situation, perhaps even coming here. Maybe you don't know people and you're a bit sort of insecure. Why not? We see people, but we see them through our particular lenses. The lenses of our assumptions and our attitudes. The people are there, but we're not seeing the people as people. And therefore, when we seem to be seeing people, we see them in the light of the assumptions that we habitually carry. It is as if we are seeing them. And because we believe we are seeing them, and, and therefore our reaction to them appears reasonable, rational. Why wouldn't I be a bit weary? But who are these people? Well, I don't want to find out because they're probably dangerous. Yeah, but you don't know. You know, I don't think I'll bother finding out. In, in, that's what I was meaning before the break, that the map, the positioning, the orientation becomes both a projective device and a filtering device. We filter out new information and we project old assumptions. And that creates a felt sense of continuity, the continuity of myself, because this is who I am, this is what I'm like, I've always been like this, and I've found a way to survive, life's not too bad. These are often the ways in which we sort of cajole ourselves herd ourselves into the continuity of these habitual patterns. The best way to wake up from that is to come back into the senses and to directly attend to what's there in front of us. To really try to see, who is this person? How can I know how another person is? Especially if I accept that the past is gone, and the future hasn't come. The question always has to be, how can I see how this person is today, at this moment with me? That's much more difficult, isn't it? Because what do I then do with the knowledge that I've accumulated about the other person? So often in, when couples have difficulties, they, they say, I can't believe it, I can't believe that you've just done that. Why? Why? <laughs> what, what is the basis of your knowledge of that person that would let you predict that they would be reliable and helpful and so on? That is to say, your behavior doesn't fit my map and I'm outraged. 
<laughs> get back into line with my map. So that gives us a sense that we're not living in the present very much at all. We may all feel that we're doing that, but actually we're, we're moving out of these particular positions. Positions which may not be a very helpful way of relating to what's in the present moment. So, with impermanence, <coughs> we're trying to really accept the past is gone. My, my childhood is gone, maybe my early adulthood is gone, summer is gone. And th this is, in a sense, an analytical practice. You can do it all the time. You know, for example, yesterday is gone. What you had for breakfast is gone. The journey to come here is gone. The first part of the meeting is gone. The tea break's gone. And just observing, this is here and it's going. This is here and it's going. As it's going, the next thing is here. Then it's going. Then the next thing's here. And you get this kind of linking sequence where something is always here, but something is always going and something's arising. So these three times are moving together like very well-attuned dancers. You see these uh, paintings of the three muses moving together. And it's just this almost seamless movement. But the, what was present is becoming past. What was future is becoming present. So what is this? It's a very narrow cut to really see what is there. All the rest is interpretation. All the rest is what I'm bringing to the situation. It's a bit like if you <clears throat> go to an art class and you're drawing something. You could be I don't know, drawing an old shoe or you could be work drawing a model. The key thing you have to practice is looking. Draw what you see, not what you imagine. For many, many people this is very difficult because they always draw the image that's in their head and they don't look enough. <coughs> and the art teacher will always be saying, look at the curve of the shoulder. What do you see? You know, what have you drawn? Does this look like that? Oh, well, I, th th I thought it was like that. You know, it's not about drawing a thought. It's about drawing what's there. Art is very, very useful as a support for meditation, particularly drawing. And then you see how you interrupt that. <coughs> If you're interested, there's a marvellous book by Marion Milner called On Not Being Able to Paint, where she looks at the unconscious factors that get in the way of her difficulty in drawing and painting. It's a very beautiful book. And it has to do with sitting in an assumption, in an idea, in a mental construct, rather than being fully embodied in the world with the world as it presents itself through the senses. Because this is all there is in the moment. There is just this, whatever this is. Now, of course, there's not just perception happening. There is also conception. So interpretation is part of our life. But if conception is always dominating perception, if our conception is like a colonialist gobbling up this territory that's revealed by perception, it's going to be re re experiencing it <coughs> excuse me, on its own terms. And what we need to do is to bring our concepts into the service of our perception. That is to say, how can my thinking about this situation illuminate what is actually there? How can it bring me closer to the facticity, to the immediacy, the givenness <clears throat> of this moment, rather than creating an alternative world which I try to protect at the expense of denying what's actually here? That's the real struggle. For example, on the political level, and it's very helpful to think about politics, because politics is the individual human psyche blown up on a big screen. So here we have this big debate about Britain's role in the world in terms of defense. Aircraft carriers, 
Do we want to have them? Do we want to have planes on top of them? Do we want to have a nuclear defence? That will cost a lot of money. You hear the politicians saying, well, we, are, we need to be a big hitter. It's a sports term, but it also involves hitting, doesn't it? Who is it we want to hit? Our enemies. Someone else might say, well, perhaps we make enemies by going around hitting people. But that's all the more reason to be a big heater. So there you see the cause and effect. Afghanistan is a hornet's nest. Let's go and kick it around a few times. Hmm, these hornets are following me home. <laughs> it's not rocket science to see that. <coughs> but there you can see we have a huge colonial legacy in this country. People want to hang on to that very inflated idea of our capacity because it's humiliating to become smaller. Well, we're all getting a bit older. As we get older, we get smaller. The body starts to shrink a wee bit. But also our capacity gets less. What we could do before, we can no longer do. It's the same for empires. Empires get old. Lots of people are predicting the end of the American empire. And China, you know, isn't its regeneration displacing it? If you hold on to a map of how you were, as a predictor of how you will be, it's very difficult then to work with circumstances. For the Americans, when they see that the Chinese are doing huge trade deals in Africa, getting military, huge uh, naval bases in Ceylon and so on, and mapping out uh, <clears throat> vast claims to the world's natural resources, when they see that, they might reflect whether ex expending huge amounts of resources in Iraq and Afghanistan is really worthwhile. What is the real end? But of course, you can't do that if you're a big hitter. Because you're a big hitter, you have to hit everything. But while you're hitting in one direction, you're not hitting in another direction. So in not being able to really see, everybody knows what's coming, but we don't want to really see it because we are preoccupied with the issues from the past. This happens to us psychologically, doesn't it? Now, how do we prepare for getting older? How do we prepare for things like redundancy or sickness? Have we really thought that we might not be as healthy as we will always be? How, we, how do we learn to live with that? That is to say, opening up a sense that how I am now is held in place by various factors which may not continue in time. Rather than saying, well, this is me, this is how I am, and I hope I'm going to continue like this because I quite enjoy my life, which is a very normal way of inhabiting one's existence as if it is mine, as if it's something in my hand, rather than our life is revealed through these many different factors. And therefore, we need to be aware of pride and an over-identification with the image, with the idea in the face of the reality. One of the great studies of this is uh, John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, particularly the section on Vanity Fair, where the pilgrim and Christian arrive in this town and everybody's completely caught up in the wonderfulness of themselves. They're very concerned with how they look and how they impress other people. And there's a very interesting discussion of how so much of life can go by in that. Because this is a place where although bad things are happening, nobody wants to know that they're happening. You know, a town the size of Macclesfield has a hospital. In the hospital there are people who are dying. We also will die. There are people who are sick. We also will be sick. There's unemployment offices. We also can become unemployed. It's the absenting of ourselves from the world as it is that allows the maintenance of a cozy sense of self. But that cozy sense of self has little resilience inside it to flexibly respond to the changes. So 
impermanence, just observing, first of all, as a conceptual analysis, observing how one thing changes into another. One thing changes. That this place was not a Buddha center, is a Buddha center, and will soon not be a Buddha center. It has had different modes. These modes change due to these causal circumstances. That's something we can all apply to the places where we live, the friends we have, the kind of relations we have with them, and to observe how we tend to want things to be more stable, <coughs> more organized than they actually are. The second level is to start to, to look at the thing that we take to be an it. So this building was not a center, is a center, and will soon won't be. It seems as if we're describing the changes to the center of this building. So what is permanent about this building? Some change has been occurring in this building and to this building, but basically this building is just this building. Is that true? It's held in place because somebody owns this building and they may continue to rent it out for a while, but probably when prices in the market pick up, they'll sell it. So it's this building will continue to have this sort of shape, this sort of organization, as long as the, how the property market in Britain is a bit deflated. As soon as it floats again, the owner will probably flog it off and hope to make a bit of a profit. Because if it's not a Dharma center, it's just a building for business. That's all. So the shape of the building, that it's got these sort of toilets and set up, may not be suitable for the person who buys it. They may gut them out and do something else, like put in another door or something. Because for them, it's a potential. Whereas for the people who are committed to this building, they see this building as it is. If an architect comes in, he's just thinking, oh, well, you could, you could lift the roof a bit. There's attic space that's not used outside. Upstairs, that's a bit of a waste. And you could do all sorts of different things. Because they would be thinking, what should we do with it? It's, that's the way we start to see our minds hold this building in place. It is the current agreed conceptualization of this space that maintains this space as this space. Someone coming in with the money and the resources to shift it, if they get a new idea, they'll shift it. So it's held in place again by an idea. So what is the buildingness of the building? What is the inherent truth or the, the true identity of this building as this building? Well, it's not inherent in the thing itself. It rests on <coughs> the meeting together of the manifold, the manifold moving factors of maintenance. These factors will start to change. Maybe the people who go on to hire this room might want to repaint it. So already you get a change. And then if it gets sold, again it will change. What is it? It is what it appears to be at the moment, and what it appears to be at the moment is held in place by the mental attitudes of the people who are involved in its ownership. It's not something in itself. This is very important. It's the same with our body. In the summer, um, I noticed on the back of my leg <coughs> there was a red circle with a circle around it. So I, uh, it was on a Sunday, so I phoned uh, the NHS direct and uh, was very lucky to be able to speak to an untrained administrative assistant <laughs> who, who advised me to put vinegar on it and <laughs> wait a few uh, days. I <coughs> politely told her that I wasn't convinced and I'd like to speak to a nurse. <clears throat> the nurse then also said something very interesting. And I said to her, let me tell you what it is, and then you can give me some advice, because I want to see a doctor today. 
So it's Lyme disease. It's brought about by being bought, bitten by a tiny tick. So then I went to see a GP and he gave me a week's worth of antibiotics. In nowhere is it described that one week of antibiotics is sufficient to cure Lyme disease. But it was a Sunday afternoon in a walk-in GP clinic and the doctor didn't really know. And he couldn't get through to his computer system. This is, this is the world we live in. This is the actual situation. So then I've had many, many stories with this and I've had to take vast quantities of very unpleasant antibiotics. Hopefully it will go. <coughs> but there is a situation where I'm having a nice time. Suddenly see this thing on my leg. What's that? And a whole new chain of events come, which influence what I can do, how I feel, how available I am to other people, and so on. Just like that. Some tiny little tick where I was walking in a forest someplace suddenly is biting me. And that happens. And that happens all the time, doesn't it? Suddenly somebody feels a bit sick and they go to the doctor and they go for tests and then they find they've got cancer or the kidneys are collapsing, whatever it would be. <clears throat> and it's so important to see that, that the factors of maintenance of our body are dynamic. We don't have a fixed thing, a body. Just as the, the illusion of having a fixed Dharma center suddenly is revealed that the Dharma center was a construction held in place by the energy and participation of a few people. And when that energy shifted, it starts to dissolve. In the same way with the body, it can easily dissolve. This doesn't mean that we should be afraid, but perhaps it lets us have a different relationship with our world. That we live in our world very lightly and also as something very precious. I am alive today. What is today? Then we look and we see and we hear. A very common uh, practice in the Zen tradition to take every day as your last day on earth. So when you wake up, you think, this is my last day. This is the last time I see these people's faces. This is the last time I drink a cup of tea. So what is this cup of tea? And because of that, you give it more attention. Instead of being an automatic pilot, instead of being off in dreams of something else, being distracted, this is it. This is all there is. And this is the absolute truth of our existence. There is the immediacy of experience, <clears throat> and there is the realm of interpretation. We need both, but the experience has to be primary. Because if you're really in the experience, thoughts, feelings, and sensations are integrated as immediate experience. But if you are absorbed in concepts as a discourse about experience, there is a kind of muffling quality, a kind of buffer zone between you and the world and you and yourself. And so that the immediacy of being present when you suddenly see birds across the sky or you suddenly feel a chill wind on the back of your neck and you're just there, oh, that gets muffled because you start, oh God, we should brought a scarf. It's important to have a scarf if it's cold. But suddenly there was winter. Winter was knocking on your neck. Huh. Wow. This is winter. Oh. Something is there. I'm here. Here I am. But oh, what's the consequence? What do I have to do? And it, it's by recognizing the patterns of these interpretations and how quickly they come, and in particular, how susceptible we are to believing that the real meaning and value of our life lies in the interpretation of the experience rather than the immediacy of the experience. That's the point where in what in traditional Buddhism is called taking refuge starts to make sense. Because to take refuge is to see I have a problem. I need a refuge. I don't necessarily need a refuge from outer things in the world. Sometimes we do. But mainly, deeply, we need a refuge from ourselves. That we despoil the fresh potential of our existence 
by cleaving to, by wrapping ourselves in this endless confectionery, this elaboration of thoughts. As if the thought was the thing itself. As if thinking about something was being with it. It's the immediacy of being present that's alive. The mediation through thought is valuable in some situations, but probably not all that many. Most of the problems in our life that require thinking can be resolved pretty quickly. If you can't think your way through a problem in 15 minutes, it's probably not the kind of problem that will resolve itself. Then you have to work out how you're going to be in that situation. And further thought would need to be recategorized as worry, preoccupation, repetitive, automatic negative thoughts, and so on, which is very different from clear thinking. And most of the time that's what's going on. Our assumptions, our interpretations are arising as if they are the owners of our existence, as if they are the ones that we require to show us what is what. The servant has become the master and the master has forgotten who they are. So, the master, if you like, the mistress of the house, is the Buddha nature, is the open, fresh potential to be present moment by moment. The servant for that is thoughts, feelings, sensations. These are sources of information and pathways of manifestation. But they shouldn't be sitting on the central throne. The throne is a spacious presence, which then can flexibly move and respond to these things. But when we observe ourselves caught up in these thoughts and trying to work it out, there is no end to thinking. There's no end to pondering, well, why am I like this? And what does this mean? And what should I do? On and on and on. It's not that that has no meaning. It has the meaning of me being a human being caught up in a cultural pattern of existence. It's a, it's a cultural story. But if we can recognize, oh, when I'm in my thought, I'm in the thought, I'm not quite here. That there is a difference between the lived quality of being present in the aesthetic moment, the difference between that and the moment of being absorbed in a thought. That being absorbed in a thought is, if you like, anesthetized. The fresh, aesthetic, vibrant concern with what is impacting is dulled because the thought has a kind of tunnel vision and following that thought one goes here and there and appears to be going somewhere but usually it's rather a circular pattern the thought chases another thought round and round and so no matter how much thinking you do you never arrive at something fresh whereas freshness was always there in front of your nose it was exactly that you make some toast, and as you cut it in half, it, you hear that. You put some butter on it, the butter dissolves on the hot toast. There is existence. There's color, smell, shape, and you're fully there. But if you're doing that and you're thinking, what am I going to do today? You don't get pulled into your existence because you're already thinking about where you have to be. And then the whole course of the day is leaping ahead of itself, projected into the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And the present isn't allowed to interrupt this pseudo-present, which is actually a melange of the future and the past. So, attending to impermanence to really see the toast is getting cold. The toast cools quite quickly. So when you first put a bit of butter 
it's me melting, and by the time you've even spread the whole bit, the butter's no longer melting because the heat of the toast has gone into the plate. That's impermanence. There is a moment when the toast can melt butter and a moment when it can't. When that moment's gone, it's not going to come back. So there we have, if you're in your senses, it's this, it's this, it's this. There is no doggy bag. Many of you have heard me saying this kind of thing before. But it's absolutely true. There is no pocket in time. You can't grasp this moment and put it away like a squirrel preparing for winter and come back to it. Because even if you take photographs, you're not going back. When you look at the photograph, you're in a new moment and in a new moment. That may be quite a nice thing to have in the new moment. But you have to know that this moment will have gone and gone and gone. So, if you relate to a representation of this moment, will it be the same as the moment? Say, for example, I don't know, you get a recording of this and you listen to it later if you're driving your car or something like that you will be in a different experience. But if you think, oh, well, it's not the same listening to this as being there, you will have interfered with the moment of just listening to it because you'll be comparing and contrasting. Comparing and contrasting is, is like a shuttlecock and a weaving thing, isn't it? It's moving up and down across time. Whereas all we have is just this. And just this is, is an amazing door which keeps opening and opening and opening and sufficient unto the day sufficient unto the moment here we are here we are here we are what we need to be in this moment will be there if we're in that moment because the moment will be whatever it is if you then think oh if only I'd done that and hadn't realized it'd be like this I should have you're not in the moment You've gone into a sort of cyberspace, a mental world, which is a kind of parallel universe, which is, you know, it's an option. But in that parallel universe, you can do nothing. Because if you're thinking about what you could have done or should have done, the time for the coulding and the shooting is gone. The time where you can actually act is now but you're not being in that now because you're in this parallel world. Which is why to look at impermanence is enormously important. It's really to have the sense each moment is unrepeatable. It will never, ever, ever come back. The whole moment. So, say for example, you arrange to go to the movies with a friend and just before you go there you have a coffee with your friend and your friend's really upset about something and they tell you this story and you're really touched and you go into the movie and you're watching the movie but half of your attention's in the story your friend's just told and you come out of the movie and you think god i'm going to get going to go and see that movie again it's a really good movie you can't see the same movie again because the movie you got was the movie where you were suffused with that feeling. That was that movie. You can see another movie. It will be called the same movie, but it will always be different because each time you see it, you will be in a particular mood. That's why there are no real objects out there. There's no real person inside. You know, when you go home, the home you go to is the home you arrive at. That will not be the same as the home you left. Because your mood will be slightly different. The light will be different. When you left this morning, the light was soft. The sun's not so up, quite a bit of cloud. But it's daylight. By the time you get home, the sun has set. It's dark. You walk up to the familiar front door. Why is it familiar? What is familiar is you know it is your own front door. Because you're in a hurry to get in, because it's cold outside, you just want to get through the door. But the door is showing you 
its relationship with this quality of darkness on this day. Because now we're moving towards the shortest day, there's different tonal qualities of the dark, aren't there? So, as you move towards putting your key in the door, it is this door. You won't see that door ever again. You will see something that you recognize as your own front door. You'll probably see it thousands of times. But the aesthetic quality, the immediacy of the light, the quality of light on the color of the door, the shape of the door, the shadows, with your particular mood, that is not going to be repeated. Does that make sense? That is very, very <coughs> radical if you really accept it. It means we have to start looking what is the relationship between the helpful <coughs> interpretations that allow us to know this is my front door so that the police don't come and accuse you of trying to break into someone else's house. This is my front door. Yet, what is this? If you have too much of the familiarity, you don't see the door. If you had too much of sort of stunned openness, it would be difficult to get on with your life. So again, it's about the middle way. We cannot live our lives without some degree of interpretation and assumption. But what is the function of the assumption? What is it serving? If it's serving a pragmatic function of supporting us in our dynamic movement in a changing world, that's one thing. Because that's actually quite fresh, quite relational, quite connected. But if it's serving the function of reassuring me that I am who I am, and this is how my life is, and this is it, <clears throat> then from a traditional Buddhist point of view, that would have to make us quite suspicious. Because it's actually functioning to dull us down, so that we live in an assumption rather than in a presence. So. That's something that we can each start to observe for ourselves. <clears throat> what, is, <clears throat> excuse me, what is the function <clears throat> what is the function of knowledge in my life? Is the knowledge being used as a support to engagement? Or is the knowledge being used as a holiday from engagement? Or as an interpreter or veil? towards engagement. That's something you can really see. <clears throat> and it will probably fluctuate between these two in, in different moments. But this is why winter can be very, very helpful. Because there's something about if there's fresh snow and you're outside, the starkness and freshness and the bare outline of the trees has a kind of immediacy that can call us back into being there. We can be, as it were, shocked out of our presuppositions. Then we, it's about tasting that. Ah. Not as a special moment, but this is, the, this is the taste of every moment of my life. Why am I not tasting it? What is it that has me, you know, sell my soul for a mess of pottage? Why am I selling myself short? Imagining <clears throat> that the stale old food of my own repeated thoughts and interpretations is more nourishing than being directly connected with what's going on. I think that's a, a very important um, thing for, for us to observe. Uh, what comfort is derived from the familiar. The familiar somehow is reassuring me that my life is as it is. There's a kind of automatic quality which means I don't have to be checking it out. Now, if, <clears throat> if you have developed in your life a sense that 
being alert, being on the job, is linked with anxiety, then of course you want to have a holiday from it. If, if you sort of had a sense, maybe as a kid or in different work situations, you've got to be pretty wired up to hold it together because somebody's on your case and you're kind of trying to de-snag things because at any moment things could be very difficult. That hypervigilance will of course seek a snoozy time. It will seek to be switch it off and just not care. So there you've got two extremes. Buzzing, too alert, especially alert in the sense of trying to know in advance what's coming. And in the other way, had enough, curl up on the sofa, leave me alone. Between these two is just being relaxed, present, and responding into the situation. A lot of the time we're much more moving between these two extremes. Too high, too low. Too tight, too loose. So the key thing here, again, is observe ourselves, see what we do, not judge or blame ourselves, but just notice, oh, I'm getting too tight. Oh, I'm getting too loose. What would be a reasonable correction? Probably the simplest method for doing that is simply to return to the senses. Just look around the room, let your gaze uh, focus on any object and just give it your full attention. Not interpreting what you see, but allowing it to reveal itself to you. And in that moment, you return to being part of the world. Rather than running through the world in a little tunnel of your own familiar preoccupation. <clears throat> yeah. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Well, that's very interesting, isn't it? I mean, we live in a culture which is quite um, emotional. So we have a lot of uh, reality TV programs where people go to an island and have maggots crawling in their hair. And then millions of people watch them screaming and squirming. And that's kind of shared horripulation, that kind of over the top. Ah! It's, it's sort of it's a hysterical movement, which is very powerful through the whole culture. I think quite a quite a frightening spirit, I would say, because it tends to go with war if it becomes a big national feeling. So it, it sort of feeds into an idea that if for something to be real, I should feel a lot about it. So if we think, well, in Buddhism they talk a lot about equanimity. Now, say someone close to us is very sick, they're dying. What would it be like to have equanimity? We think, well, this is my, my brother, or my dad, or my mum. How, how could I have equanimity? How, you know, I go to see them maybe in a hospital or in a home. I see other people being sick or ill, but I'm concerned about, I don't know, my dad, 
There are other people's dads who are sick, but that's other people's dads. We're feeling, my dad, my dad's dying. That, of course, is to be caught up in one's own life story. Because there are two possibilities there. One is to think, may all sentient beings be happy. Who is dying today? Thousands of people. My dad and other people's dads. All of these people are dying. May they go well. May their lives go well. May they be free from suffering. That way, because the perspective has opened up, one can still have feelings, but there's a different kind of poignancy. Because death is part of the condition of all living things, rather than an enormous tragedy that's running across my life. And in that moment, the intensity is increased because it's as if it's only happening to me. So, I mean, that practice could appear much too cool to many people. They'd say, for God's sake, you know, this is your dad, well, he's dying, come on. You should, don't you feel something? So that's the, the encouragement. You can feel lots of things. You could feel self-pity, sadness. I mean, endless number of feelings could be evoked by that. The question would be, well, what is the function of the feeling? For sure something is happening, but what is happening? Somebody who was born, who lived a life, who was healthy and running around doing things, is now going down and fading. After spring, there was summer, there was autumn, and now we're moving into winter. If the person's lived long enough for that to be happening, that's what it is. Who is the one who is distraught? The one who wants summer to last. What is that? Why am I disturbing myself? It doesn't mean one shouldn't feel some concern for the person who's dying or sick or um, be touched by it. But it's something about, well, what are the blinkers that go on? What is this bubble of concern that I'm wrapped in that's, that's churning me up? There are so many things I wanted to say, I've never been able to say them, it's too late now, da 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 da, da. all of this. Oh yeah, it's gone. It's gone. But I didn't want it to be gone. I want it to be other than it is. So that's then a very um, important place to be, to think, I am struggling against the universe as it is. I am wanting a condition which is not the case. When I was small, my mother said, the fire is hot. If I put my finger in the hot, in the hot fire, I get burned. It's hot. Why would you put your finger in it? I just wanted to see. It's sort of like that, isn't it? We know that many people have died. We know that there is sorrow in death. We are now partaking of our share of that experience. That could be, my world is so awful, I can't bear it. Or it could be, I am partaking of the world. This is how it is. And in that moment, we can reach out to other people. And that would be the general Mahayana approach to that. And, but of course it is a practice, it is really hard. Because the bit of us that feels like collapsing into it, and the bit of us that would need to work hard to hold on to another idea that would give more perspective and shape, that's a real struggle. But they would. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. The very essence, of it, the, the very essence of it is the actual attachment to such. Mm. As such, that's the, the long and short of it. That's the problem. That's the bottom line. The actual attachment. Why 
are you so attached to that person? Mm -hmm. Manifests itself. You become, you become more attached, mm -hmm. more attached, and the more you're attached, the more it's a, a bombshell when a person passes away or dies, because you're that uh, uh, attached to that particular individual person. Mm -hmm. So again, we, we might need to tease out certain notions here, that if in this culture love and attachment have become very welded together, we might need to separate these out, that loving someone is wishing them well, rather than wanting them to be with me. I love you, don't leave me, very often go together. Whereas, I love you, I wish you well, may you be happy, may all beings be happy, is immediately much more spacious. And as you say, if you, if you over-invest in someone, then it carries with it the fantasy, they will always be able to provide that function for us. Just as if you over-invest in, in having a job, or having a particular lifestyle, or in being healthy, it creates um, a kind of illusion. Because I feel wobbly in my life, here's this idea, I will always be healthy, or my mum won't die, or they'll always take care of me, so in my wobbliness I fall onto them and they're propping me up and then impermanence happens and they start to move away and I'm returned not only to my unresolved old anxiety but to the anxiety created by them leaving. what we mean by that. I mean, attachment is, is essentially holding on to something as if it was a thing. Now, if you think of somebody who you've known a long time, a parent or a child or a friend, the only continuous thing about your relationship is that person's name. We call someone dad, we call someone mum. But day by day, they have been changing. Day by day, they've been doing different things, having different thoughts, talking to other people. So, we have been using a name which seems to have a, a definitional quality to it. This is my mum, this is my dad. I know who they are, I've known them a long time. That is being applied to a process. You know, as the ancient uh, Greek uh, philosopher Heraclitus said, you can never step in the same river twice. You call the river, the river Thames, the river Tiber, whatever, you, you can go bathing in the same river every day, but you'll never be in the same river. That is to say, the name of the river means if I swim in the river Clyde on Monday and I swim in the river Clyde on Tuesday, on two occasions I have swum in the river Clyde. But the actual river, the water, the immediacy of the river has changed. It was a different river on Tuesday from on Monday. So if you see your mum on Tuesday, it's a different mum from on Monday. So what is our attachment to? It's to the idea of our mother, the accumulation. What in psychoanalysis nowadays they call the object relations. The, the built-up image or imago which is invested. What has actually been happening is that this person has been changing, just as we have been changing. But So we've both got the freshness of encountering them every time we meet, and then this build-up of this huge sense, the felt sense of who they are, and the function that they have in our lives. And it, it, that, it is that which is the attachment. Who, and who is it that we can love? We can't really love the object of our attachment because if we do I love you for your function in my life that's pretty small it's not even being able to say I love you for being you it's I love you for being you for me and and that's often the thing isn't it that there's something in me which is desperate to want you to be who I need you to be which again takes us back to the notion of refuge that if you take refuge in a path, it could be the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, it could be in Jesus Christ, it could be in anything. But if you have a path that says, 
there is a transcendence or there is an opening which I can become part of, it reconceptualizes, it reframes the ordinary investments of our life. Because we start to see that we are part of something very, very big rather than just having our small life that we're trying to protect against difficulty and danger. That's a, that's a huge step. So, this is a real question. How, how to love someone if you're a Buddhist? How to care for children if you're a Buddhist? That you have obligations, hopefully love and good feeling and wanting to be with them in, in many different ways. But at the same time, if you overinvest in these people, it can become a controlling imprisonment of that situation. And that's not very helpful. So, allowing somebody to be as they are and loving them as they are with a maximum of openness and support and a minimum of demand that I need you to be a reassuring object of me is probably, you know, what we can aim for. That's right. You meet someone and you fall in love with them or you really care about them and it takes you out of yourself. And being taken out of oneself is so marvelous. Where shall I go today? We fall in love. You know, that, that is, that's the whole thing. I, I absolutely agree. It's one of the reasons why people drink alcohol. It takes you out of yourself. These are m methods of shifting our mood and they, they can make us feel very, very good. The problem is then the other becomes a method of shifting my mood. Don't leave me, I will be in despair. Hmm? Some of them I feel I don't care. It's like going to a mystery. The mystery is wilder and healthy. You know, my eyes are open. I can see Absolutely, but that's, that's not the same as attachment. That's what I would be describing as the aesthetic openness. Right. Yeah, right. Being, being present with the thing. The, the question would be, is what, what I really love is to go walking on that hill. And I go walking and I just feel so fresh and I take my dog and it's gorgeous. You see what the bloody builders are doing? They're bringing their trucks up and they're going to cut into that hill. I'm going to... Because... Ah, <laughs> then you have a lot of freedom. <laughs> mm. yeah. Yes, absolutely. I mean, it's not to say that one has to homogenize everything and flatten it out. You can have all, all the variation of life, the ups and the downs, as long as you're open to the ups and the downs. If you're just trying to be, hop from one peak to another, that would be more difficult. You know, if one can be fully open to everything. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I just feel on the passion side, on the wild side, is, 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 is not talked about so much. Yeah, you know, well, you're the one who's not the It, I suppose it depends how you understand that because I mean we have this word enthusiasm yeah. in theos it means God coming into us yeah. so you can be enthusiastic as the spirit of openness or the divine however you want to call that you get more out of the world the question would be do we ham it up in some way do we overcook it it is what it is so you can you can both have the wonder of it, and it's gone. It's impermanent. 
It's like if you have a peak experience and you hang on to it or you try to turn it into something, it's likely to become dross. So being open to everything would probably be seen more as more important than seeking peak experiences. So it's not that one would be against... Hmm? Yeah, absolutely. And we should have some lunch. Okay, <coughs> so maybe we start just with a little bit of practice. You just sit in a comfortable way and relax into the out breath and we simply stay present with whatever is occurring. Usually we do this with the eyes more open, the eyes just open into the space in front of us without making any strong conceptual differentiation between inside, outside, what's me, what's not me to relax into an openness and a welcoming of whatever is occurring. Just do that for some time. And if you find yourself getting caught in thoughts, or if you find yourself thinking, I don't know what's going on, which of course is a sign of being caught in thoughts, then again just allow a slow, open out-breath and just relax into that state. Okay. <coughs> we'll do this practice several times and we'll do it for quite short periods of time. It may feel as if it's nothing at all, <coughs> but it's uh, very important and I'll explain why. There are various aspects to what we call the mind. One aspect is more participative, one aspect is more still. Awareness itself, that is to say our basic capacity to be present, is, as some of you will know very well, often compared to being like a mirror. The mirror is able to show many images because it has no fixed content in itself. If you have a, a painting, like you see the paintings here, they have a content to them. When you look at them, they always look the same thing. But if you look into a mirror, it shows different things. From the moment you got up this morning, many things have happened for you. Perceptions, sensations, thoughts, and so on. A ceaseless flow of experience. That experience is revealed to you through your own present in its manifesting. One experience is followed by another, by another, by another. In order for the new experience to come, the old experience has to be going. Otherwise, the new experience would be mixed up with the old experience. So, if you go to have lunch, and they bring you the food, if you look at the edge of the plate and find that it's got dried food on it, you want to say to the waitress, I'm not very happy about this. I want a clean plate, because it's fresh food. In the same way with your mind, if you can be fresh, open and available, you are here. If the plate of your existence is stacked up with accumulations of old experience, you get a kind of contamination. You're not so clear about what's going on. So, when we just sit, we're present with whatever is occurring. There is no explicit intention to create anything. Nothing artificial is being required. And we experience the mind going wherever it goes. Sometimes happy, sad, Sometimes attentions may be drawn by something in the room or by some thought in your head. If awareness is kept calm and steady, the process of the manifestation continues by itself. 
That is to say, something's always going on. It's always stuff. What is that stuff? The more you observe it, it reveals itself as a potential. Because the more you see the rich variety of the content of experience, the more you have resources for moving into the world and being with others. Okay. So, when we relax, who is the one who is having the experience? On a very immediate, direct uh, level, I am. That's not even a concept, it's just a fact. I'm here. I, I might not even know how I'm here or what I'm here as, but in being alive, something is going on. Who is the one who is experiencing the something? That's I am. What am I experiencing? A whole sequence of things. Happiness, sadness, tiredness, memories of the past, hopes of the future, and so on. All of these are flowing ceaselessly. The one who is present and aware of them is not flowing or changing, but because it has no particular content of its own, when you try to find it, you can't find anything. The content of the mind is always showing something. And this is why we tend to say strongly, I'm tired, or I'm working, or I've got something to do. The statements we make about ourselves are fused with the current content of our experience. Yeah? And it, it needn't be something particularly immediate. It can also be a concept. I can say, I'm British. I've got a British passport. I'm British. That's a, an abstract conceptualization which I make use of at airports and so on. Most of the time, being British is neither here nor there. But at certain points, when you enter into other domains, it's very important to define yourself on that level. In saying, I am British, I am creating a particular conceptualization. I'm saying there is a specific content of me which is linked to the world in a particular way, my Britishness. Then, next thing I know is, I'm thirsty. So, the thought, I'm British, is replaced by the thought, I'm thirsty. Or if I'm in the airport, how do I get to the gate? Will I get there on time? Maybe some anxious thought arises. So, in that way, there is the arising and then the passing. The arising and the passing. And two things are, are true simultaneously. On the level of being the open awareness, I am nothing at all. I am not any specific content. I am the capacity to reveal the content that's there in the moment. Simultaneously with that, I am the content. If I say I'm thirsty, in the moment that I say that, it's going to be true. No other reason to say it. It is true. I'm thirsty. Who is the one who is thirsty? I am, where I am relates to this embodiment at this moment. Due to causes and circumstances, the amount of salt in the food and so on, I suddenly feel a bit thirsty. That is true and impermanent. Because, with the help of my beloved glass of water, I don't need to remain thirsty for very long. The thirstiness as a true content, which if I didn't have the water, could start to be troubling and would take up more and more power inside my existence by taking some water, by altering the conditions, the thirst immediately starts to recede and I am no longer thirsty. So what am I now? There's always something. <laughs> That is the main teaching from my mother. <laughs> There's I something going on in this house. <laughs> it's like that. Something is always happening. 
Who is it happening to? The one who is aware. Now, this is the this is the deeper meaning of non-duality. I am both empty and full. I am empty in being the nature of the mirror, always empty, nothing happening, just a pure, a pure, clear awareness. But within that mirror, there is always a reflection arising, reflections which are changing moment by moment. So I'm this, I'm that, I'm that. What I am might not be anything that feels particularly me. Say I suddenly hear an airplane going overhead. I'm listening. What I'm listening to is the airplane. So I'm fully attentive to the airplane. That is to say, the, the sense of airplane fills my world. And my conscious sense of being a reflective subject diminishes. And then something else happens. And I'm thinking, I wonder where it's going. What's happening? One thought, another thought. Then the thought moves to feeling, feeling moves to sensation, then thought, rippling, rippling, just like endless waves in a pond when the wind's blowing. Each of these is my existence. It would be ridiculous to deny it because whatever is happening is related to the field of experience we share with other people. However, the unique specificity of my existence cannot be defined just by the content of my life. Because if I fall into the reflection, if I fall into a preoccupation with the content of what is happening to me moment by moment, then it's like sticking your head in a tumble dryer. You just go round and round. And you go all over the place. That becomes very problematic, isn't it? Then it's one damn thing after another. Because the particular thing that happens then is if I identify as the content, with the content, I take on a shape, a shape which can then be battered by other events. Yeah? And if I'm totally identified with a particular position, it then becomes imperative that other things happen. You see that with small children. You know, maybe you take them out for a walk and you forgot to take some juice with you. At a certain point, they say they're thirsty. You say, don't worry, we'll be there in a minute. And they say, ah, but I want a drink, I want a drink. And it's very, it's quite a hassle. Isn't it? You've got to try and find them a drink as quickly as possible. Because for them, they don't have a conceptual overview I will get a drink in 15 minutes. 15 minutes isn't very long. They don't know what 15 minutes is. If they're four, they're just thirsty. And they get into a bit of a bad mood. This is what happens when you just have the identification. You're at the mercy of the circumstance. Now, as adults, we open up a reflective space in which we move across time. We think, I've been here before, I'm thirsty, it'll be okay, there'll be some place in about half an hour, I can bring that up. So what we do is we go into a dialogic sequence, we talk to ourselves about our condition. Not a bad thing to be able to do. You're managing yourself in the situation by bringing other information in to contextualize the problem. However, the distance is it means I'm using identification with one thought to rectify the imbalance of being strongly identified with a sensation. So identification is following identification is following identification, which keeps me always in the, the realm where everything's a bit real. It's a bit strong. This is all there is. That's the fundamental problem. Because the sequence of experience continues from being born and in the womb as well. When you look at these photos of little creatures in the womb, they seem to be having something going on for them. So experience goes on right till the point of death. And then, if you believe, then through death into rebirth and so on. It doesn't stop. The purpose of meditation is not to try to stop it but to increasingly bring these two factors together, the openness or the emptiness and the manifestation. Because then 
change or the impermanent flow of experience is reunited with its own ground. For example, if we have the image of the mirror again, when you look in the mirror, you see a reflection. The ground of the reflection is the emptiness of the mirror. If the, if the mirror wasn't empty, you wouldn't have a reflection. Of course, there's something outside, there's some causes and circumstances of what's being presented in front of the mirror. But it is the very emptiness of the mirror that allows the reflection. This is the central point. Your emptiness, the fact that you don't exist as one thing, the fact that you can't be reduced to any particular definition, allows you the freedom to be many different people in many different situations. This is the basis of compassion, because compassion means to come into the world being with others as they are, not putting a burden on them that they have to fit in with us. So that flexibility of response can only arise from not being a particular thing. So when we do that sitting practice, all sorts of stuff is arising. It's not about judging it as being good or bad, helpful or unhelpful, but just being aware, oh, this is my mind. Whatever I think I would like my mind to be, or imagine my mind to be, this afternoon, at this time, this is me. I can only fully allow myself to be this if I know it won't be forever. So I might feel tired or bored, I might feel interested, I might feel fascinated by some thoughts, I might be relaxed and open. Whatever is the content, don't try to change it into something else. Neither falling into it, that is to say, not merging with it, not saying, this is what I really am, nor stepping back from it and observing across a distance, looking at it, I am the unmoved mover, but allowing the momentary identification and then it's gone, and then it's gone. It's gone because it dissolves back into the mirror. The reflection never leaves the mirror. The reflection is a quality of the creativity or the potentiality of the mirror. It's not a thing. In this whole world, there are no things. Now clearly, we can take something like what we call this glass in my hand and say, manifestly, James is holding something. If we look at it, it's not an object that we've never seen before. So we could say, James is holding a glass. The glass is a thing. It's a thing made in a factory, sold in a shop, for the purpose of holding liquids. This much is fairly clear. What makes it a thing? Well, we know it's a thing. It appears as if there's nothing to inquire into there. It's manifestly something. It's the sort of thing we call a glass. What is the thingness of the thing? That is to say, what makes this an entity? We could say, this glass is existing by itself. Would that seem to be right? It's left the factory, it's here now. Yeah? It's here now, but where is it? It's in my hand. If I was to become a little bit tired of holding this glass and just dropped it, perhaps we wouldn't have a glass. Perhaps we'd have fragments of glass. Would that seem likely? So, this glass is not just a glass, it is a glass in my hand. Yeah? 
it's inseparable from its context because we know it's glass therefore we handle it with some care we put it down carefully if you wash it you put it carefully if you're stacking it you don't put heavy dishes on top of it you think it won't could break it's a glass right so what we've got there is half a sentence pretending to be a full sentence it's a glass comma it's a glass that's always somewhere always in a context the context and the glass are inseparable this is very very important because when you look around the room you see people these people are in this room you see people in a room if you know the person then you think oh it's just them hello and in that moment of saying hello it's as if the context vanishes and it's just this person this person in this room has probably three possibilities they're sitting on the mat on the floor they're sitting on a chair or they're standing up we're not doing yoga so they're probably not standing on their hands or their head each person is somewhere doing something the somewhere and doing something is not after the fact it's not that there is a basic noun which is then modified or qualified by adjectives and adverbs it's that the nounness of the noun is based on a denial of the context so the glass is a glass always in relation to something else it's a glass because it's not a piece of chocolate yeah. so you have the basic rule of exclusion of opposites part of the way we define something is by knowing what it's not so we can say all the things this is this is not a space rocket it's not President Obama oh it is a glass but it's a glass in my hand this may seem a bit abstract but it's very very important because it means whenever you see something it's in a particular setting and its meaning is through its usage in that setting I could also break the edge of this uh, glass and use it to cut myself. Some people will be doing that. Maybe not in Macclesfield, but certainly in London. Saturday night, drink a bit, cry a bit, cut yourself. Some people like to cut themselves with rough surfaces because it makes a better wound. This will have many, many possible usages. We can think of many different things we could use this for. You could uh, heat, hold it over a candle, heat it up and use it for cupping to take some of the blood to the surface on someone. You could break it and stick it in someone's face in a pub. There are many, many things you can use this for. Friendly things, unhelpful things. You could turn it upside down and use it to cut out little biscuits if you'd rolled out, rolled out some dough. Its function is manifold. But many of these functions will be hidden if we hold very strongly to the essentialized definition it's just a glass. This is at the heart of seeing what the Buddhist notion of attachment is. Attachment is a limiting perception, a reified and essentialized definition which then leads into objectification. So that instead of this object being a something which we are experiencing together something which reveals itself in the moment of its use in the moment of our participation with it we take it to be something which is just what it is but just what it is depends on the convention of how we apply a naming to it I hope that doesn't sound too abstract it's actually very very practical and we know that in relationships you, may, you meet someone and they become your friend but then they do something and you don't feel so friendly towards them the fact that you're friends for a while 
means that certain activities happen between you. You might meet more regularly, you might share more intimate things and so on. And then something happens and you don't feel so friendly. So generally you meet less frequently and you don't say such intimate things when you do meet. So what that means is words refer to activities. This whole world is created out of activity. This glass is an activity. That is to say, it is something progressing through time and it's not as passive as it looks. Because part of the quality of the glass is to exist in the world in a way that our energy links with it to bring it into activity. Just as if you were walking down the street and you saw a little baby wrapped in a blanket, would you walk by? Let's hope not. You would look around. Anyone there? Hello? Look at the baby and pick it up. What's this baby doing in the street? The baby is not able to do anything. <laughs> but the baby makes you pick it up just by being in the street. Is that true? The glass makes us do things. The glass exists in the world as a coal. A table exists in a way that a chair doesn't. If you look for something to sit on, you don't sit on the table, you sit on the chair. If you see things in that way, everything we see, everything we hear is a movement in time and space. It is an activity. This room, if you like, is an activity. It seems quite static, but our experience of it is in terms of how it reveals itself as we turn our head, as we walk in it, sit and so forth. It's revealing itself as a co-participant in our perception of it. This is very important because it indicates there is nothing stable anywhere. There are no entities. There are no truly self-existing things. There are moments of disclosure. Being discloses itself in manifold forms. And because of this, the door is always open to our participation. Who is the one who closes the door on ourselves? Ourselves. Through our shyness, our internal thoughts, our feelings and so on. The world is open. This is very, very important in terms of the meditation. So, when we sit and relax, the eyes are still open, the room is here, Maybe we hear people moving outside, some people in the room's body moves a bit. Life is going on. By letting life go on, however it goes on, you are present in something which is you as the one who is present, because you're alive, it's your experience, you are in this room. But nothing that's going on is necessarily particularly about you. It's just stuff. And then you find yourself caught up in something. So a certain kind of thought or sound catches your attention and you're into it. And then you come out of it and then there's just stuff. So you have there three modes or three moments. There's just being open, neutral stuff, all stuff, no bias. And then this stuff, which you're in, then this stuff dissolves back into open. Then stuff, this stuff. These are the three modes of existence. In the tantric system, they're called the three kayas Dharmakaya, Sambhogakaya, and Nirmanakaya. Means the mind's openness is never closed. It's not a thing. You are not a thing. The Buddha is not a thing. 
It is a living subjectivity which is never conditioned by any particular content. It is unknowable as a thing. That's why you cannot know yourself. What you can do is be yourself. You can be present in the moment of your existence as it occurs. But it's not something you can know because it's not a thing. But it, that openness is inseparable from everything that we experience. So we sit in this room, wherever we are in the room, on the floor, on the chair, and we have our own unique field of experience. No one, no two people in this room have exactly the same field of experience. Within that field, many things are happening. We speak English, we have to say something like, like many things are happening, but none of them are things. Perhaps we should say many moments are occurring, many gestures. These are all activities. If you're just relaxed and open and welcoming, there's no need for any bias or particularization. But then something happens, and there you are, whirling inside one particular form for a while, and then it's gone. That particularization has two aspects. One is it can be a habitual local. This is the kind of thought or feeling that takes my fancy. I'm a bit of a sucker for this kind of phenomena. And off we go, creating a particular pattern. That's the samsaric repetition compulsion. That's me choosing things which confirm me of the continuity of my individual self as the one I know I am. The other aspect of my the nirvana side is this gesture arises, it's connective, and it's gone. That is to say, I hold the experience of the thing that I'm caught up in within the field of everything else. And that everything else-ness is held within the openness. So, <clears throat> as a general example, I'm sitting here. Things are moving, people's bodies moving and so on. We each have an infinite experience of all this from whatever position you're in. So the all this all thisness ness of what is here is moving and changing within the openness of what is here. So the openness and the all thisness is there. And then we are caught by a particularity. Somebody moves their hand, somebody moves their neck, and the gaze is caught and you're drawn for a moment into that. Yeah? At that moment, you could start to judge why is the person doing that, da-da-da, da-da-da, da-da-da. Then you take that first pathway, the samsaric catching of the moment and layering it with your own interpretation. Now you're telling the world what it is. Or, in the other direction, though of course you're neither moving one way nor the other, you simply aware of the particular movement occurring within inside the field of experience, which is inseparable from the openness of the ground of the field of the experience. That's something just to keep exploring for yourself. The language sounds a bit, a bit kind of heavy and abstract, but it's not really abstract at all. Just that very, if you hold to the simple idea of the plate and the food, you know, if you if you put I don't know some peas on the plate, and then on top of that you put some custard, and then you put some ice cream, and then you put some gravy, at a certain point you want to vomit over it. But we do that in ourselves all the time. We build up these accumulations. The central point is, if everything is impermanent. If the past is really gone, where is the accumulation? Hmm? Life is not a lasagna. 
It's not stacked up layer after layer, and yet it appears to be so. Yeah? We get burdened. We get caught by this stuff that we carry around with us. Wounds from the past, maybe some relationship that went wrong even years ago. And something happens and you remember it and it's all reactivated. So important to really observe. Where is that experience? We can feel that we are pulled into the past. It's as if it only happened yesterday. It all seems so fresh. That's a metaphor. It's not an actuality. We are here in this moment and a compound, a complex of thoughts gathers together. And then it's gone. The complex was actually simple because it was just a moment in time. We build on it by linking one moment to another moment to another moment to another moment, as one thought follows another. So instead of it coming all stacked up like some ghastly club sandwich, it's not skewered top down, it's linked through time. It's a concatenation of moments, touching and touching and touching and linking across. And that gives the sense of continuity. Just as when you go to the cinema, the movie seems to have a continuity of line, but it's actually made up of frames. And when the frames are accelerated at a particular speed, it creates the illusion of a continuous story. This is what's happening. The linking together of the frames comes from our identification. We glue these separate moments of experience which are arising and passing, arising and passing. Just as if you took the film out, you would see one frame, then the celluloid thing, then the next frame, then the next frame, and each is separate with its own gap. Our attachment links these moments together and creates this sense of being caught up in something, something which has an inevitability. Does that make sense? Does that register with your experience? That when you get pulled into something, it keeps going until it stops. And it seems to have a life of its own. But it's actually one thought following another. But somehow we have to keep doing it. Maybe some of you have the experience in a quarrel. You know you should shut up. But you just have to say it. You just have to. Because it makes sense from the internal logic. In terms of being with the other person, it's not a good idea. It's egotistic. It's egotistic. That's right. That's right. That's right. Because right. we are caught up in something. We're, we've got a small, narrow framework in which winning the point is more important than securing the continuity of a pathway of connection. So the function of the meditation, first of all, is to open up this just relaxed open space. You're not going to find it as some kind of divine revelation falling out of heaven, but it's not something. It doesn't come with the angel Gabriel and bands of light. It is simply the reception of whatever is occurring. For example, when we come into a room like this, unless we're an architect or an estate agent, we don't think in terms of how many square meters are in this room, but you might see, oh, there's quite a lot of people here, so it's quite a big room. We see the nature of the room by what it can do, by its function in holding quite a lot of people. In the same way, the emptiness of the mind is not something that you find sitting by itself the very emptiness or availability of awareness is revealed through the manifold things that it offers hospitality to moment by moment. It has to be big. It has to be infinitely fresh. It has to be pure and unconditioned because since you got up this morning, you've experienced a lot. You've experienced millions of things. 
millions of moments. You just turn your head from one side to the other. How many things occur? Very simple. One side of the room vanishes and the other appears. This is the basic openness that we have to phenomena. This is being as it comes into the world with others. Staying present in that way and allowing everything to come gives a freedom. In Tibetan it's called rangba. It's like water falling down a mountain. The water just falls wherever it falls. Sometimes, if you've seen that out in the country, you see a waterfall and you're up in the hill and the wind's blowing. And so the wind comes in a gust, one minute the water's coming down like that, the next minute the gust catches the water and spreads it out that way. So in the same way, we sit in the meditation. We're not trying to be just one thing. We're not tracking the breath. We're not visualizing a deity. We're letting the mind move as it moves inseparable from the spaciousness. The movement and the spaciousness are one thing. Then, within that fusion of movement and spaciousness, you look around, you see people, later we'll have a break, you talk to people. When you get up and you start to talk, that is movement within the field of movement. No? When we are sitting here, the whole room is moving. It's moving in time. Moving and moving. But we're often not aware of that movement. It's as if we're just sitting here. And we are fixed observing the movement. As if you're sitting on holiday at some, you know, cafe on the pavement and people are coming and going and you sit there with your coffee just looking at life in the little town. You're looking at life in the town, you're looking, you're thinking, observing and drinking coffee. You're pretty active too. But you take that activity for granted. So what we're doing here is not taking up an observer position as somebody apart, but to see that all my thinking, feeling and sensation is part of the movement. I am movement within movement. And then when we have the break and we get up, we're moving with others, making specific gestures, saying, what are you doing? Or, How is this? Or, whatever it would be. That movement is occurring inside the general movement. One of the things that keeps Britain reasonably warm is that we have the Gulf Stream moving across from South America, across the Atlantic, to come here. The Gulf Stream is in the ocean. Water is moving inside water. Yeah. There is a directionality in the Gulf Stream, but the water in the Gulf Stream is not very different from the water around it. It's water. In the same way, we are each a stream within a big stream. We sit in this room. This is like one big river. And each of us is streaming inside that. And sometimes the nature of our streaming is that we swerve. So you say something to someone. And your stream becomes contiguous with theirs. You touch them. You move them. Something happens. And what they see moves your stream and then you move into someone else. So in the break you might talk to five, six, ten people. Each of these interactions is going to be different. So there you experience the movement of yourself forming and reforming in a flexible way like a river stream. A stream which is not separate. You're not on the bank looking at what's there. You're in movement, as movement, with movement. And that movement is inseparable from the unchanging ground, like the mirror. That's the basic uh, view of Sokshen, which is very helpful for relaxing and opening and being present. So we can maybe try that practice again.
no need to consciously do anything. Relax into the out-breath and then just sitting with whatever occurs. Okay. So, clearly, when we <coughs> look around the room, we, we can recognize people, even if you don't know their names, you've seen them in the morning. Shapes, the uh, identifiable nature of shapes, stands between everything being dynamically impermanent and changing everything about it, and everything being fixed. So we all have identifiable features. Our way of walking, our way of talking, tone of voice, certain kinds of interests that we might have, being interested in football or not, being interested in cooking or not, and so on. These become fairly predictable identifiers. And it's very important to have a sense of how these function. Because if moment by moment the unique patterning of the moment is changing, there is nonetheless some continuity of certain patterns. Otherwise you wouldn't recognize things. So <coughs> what is that pattern? What is the structuring of the world? According to Buddhism there are various ways of understanding that. One would be to say that there are the five elements, earth, water, fire, wind and space. And each of us has these five elements in particular uh, patternings. And these patternings can shift. They can be shift from the morning to the evening. Some people have more wind and fire in the morning. Some people have more wind and fire in the evening. That's to say they're more active in one space than in the other. It can also be triggered by whether it's a cloudy day. Some people are very affected by a gray sky. Other people not so affected. So the, the particular pattern of the five elements that we have can reveal uh, certain continuities or certain ways in which we're likely to be evoked. We also have the, what are called the five poisons. Um, stupidity or a, a strong tendency to assumption, um, a lot of uh, desire or hunger or longing, uh, aversion or rejection or anger, pride and jealousy. These are fairly common factors in all our lives. But the balance between them can shift according to the season again. Somebody might not be very jealous in the winter when they're wrapped up warm, but when summer comes around and all the magazines are saying, are you trim and ready for the beach? They might become very jealous or envious of someone else who weighs four stone less than they do. So the evocation of, of these feelings can be, is very contingent and contextual, as everything is. These create, these are some of the structures which underlie the patterns that we have. A pattern is dynamic. It's not a fixed thing. It is identifiable as a pattern, but a pattern is a patterning of events moving in time. So, the people who are interested in football will know that you know, when a team is preparing for a big match, they will look at films of the team they're going to play, and they'll try to work out the likely moves that people make. Because it's fairly predictable what sort of moves famous footballers do. And if you can understand that, then you know how to block them or challenge them or deal with what they're about. And people spend a lot of time doing that, just as people who play chess examine famous chess matches and try to see what their new opponent will do. Or bridge players get very used to trying to have a sense of whether someone's going to be bluffing or whatever it would be. Because you can see what they're about. The key thing there is that these are patterns in time. 
It's not like a, a pattern printed on a piece of cloth. It's a pattern which is actually the articulation, the joining together of dynamic elements as they unfold. Just as you would see if you watch somebody dancing. You would think, oh, that's how they dance. That's the way they move. That's what they do. These are the sort of gestures that person makes. Their body in relation to music moves in that way. And we know that if we put on certain kinds of music, they will get up and dance. And if you put on other kinds of music, they will sit down. Because they will not dance to that other kind of music. So that's what, that's what patterning is. It is associative. It is link sequences of gesture, posture, breath, in relation to the unfolding of the environment. So there is no fixed essence in that. It's rather the repertoire of our most familiar moves grounded in the open potential of our being. And part of loosening up inside is that we realize we can learn new patterns. We can learn new ways of being appropriate. And the quickest way to do that is to copy other people. Mimicking is very important. If other people do it and get away with it, probably we can as well. Rather than thinking, well, only if it rings true for me can I do it. A much better solution is to say, if it works in the world, it will work for me too. Because our behavior is public. And if other people do it, it is socially acceptable behavior. So then we can think, well, what is the... What is it that stops me making that socially acceptable move? Oh, the thing that stops me is my sense of who I am. So we can be linked primarily to the shared field of experience or linked primarily to a tight reading of our own identity. And one of the functions of meditation is to keep relaxing these tight narratives so that we can develop a few more moves. Okay, so we move towards taking a break and then we'll come back and do some more practice and so on. Just before we do that, uh, this evening, uh, as a way of just marking the end of our time in this space, for those who'd like to, at about six, we'll nip round to the pub on the corner and have a drink and then come back uh, at seven and share some food in here together. So we have a bit more time to chat and connect. Also, uh, we just reprinted the, the book Simply Being. It's a new third edition and I brought some copies of that with me. So in this break you could you could get them. I'm selling them below the market price. <laughs> so you get them for a bargain 15 quid. And uh, not only that, but the cover of the book is quite nice, so we printed up some t-shirts with that on it as well. So we're going global here. <laughs> and if you would like uh, one of these for yourself or a Christmas present, you could have a look at them. We'll lay them out on the floor here in different sizes and colors. Okay, so tea break time. So... <clears throat> All that has happened in this room in the time that it's been functioning at a, as a Buddha center is gone. We're in the last embers of the fire. And yet some of it has gone somewhere else, some, some new offshoots beginning. Some of what has gone leaves traces in people's minds, memories, inspirations, and so on. question I think for us at a, a sort of transitional time like this is how to hear the goingness the vanishing how to be with vanishing without a bit of one vanishing oneself that all the hours of participation the um, voluntary work that many people have done to create and sustain the center over time When things come to an end, you might think, well, what was the point? 
when that feeling arises, it's very helpful. Because it then helps us think, well, had I made some kind of implicit contract? Had I been building some kind of house in which to dwell? Some kind of sense that I'm preparing for the winter of my life and therefore having this in place would be good. Not a, not a bad idea. But with the uh, attention to impermanence, we can see that often that's not going to be the case. It takes us back to what we looked at in the morning, of the, the importance of enjoyment as the quality of full participation without any intention of der deriving a future benefit. That is to say, if the immediate moment is complete in itself, then you're more free to be in the next moment and the next moment. But if there's the sense that this present moment has embedded in it some kind of lack, but I'm willing to put up with it as a means to an end, as a, as a way of generating this other possibility later, that becomes a bit problematic. Because clearly we've no idea what the future is going to be. And people can often feel sad that something that was created has, as it were, been lost or destroyed or isn't available. That's a good, and sometimes painful, but it's a very good reminder of the importance of being as completely here when we are here, so that whatever there is to be gained from this can fill us, we can be redolent with it, it becomes part and parcel of our existence. So that what continues through time is not hanging on to something, I got something and I want to make sure I don't lose it, but rather that the quality of one's being has been influenced by what has occurred and therefore whether you're particularly conscious of it or not, your path forward is moved in a different way. That it, it becomes part and parcel of who we are. Because that's the most sustainable kind of change. If you have to keep reminding yourself and making a very conscious practice, although that's, that's very helpful and having a, a regular daily meditation practice can be very useful, the very fact that you have to do something and then you have to work out how you're going to do it on the day where you don't feel like doing it, that requires conscious agency, intentionality, the, and the very directedness of that can provide a, a kind of self-reflectiveness which again, can shrink our world. So the, the real quality of the practice is to try to bring it into us and make it as invisible as possible. Because the basic principles are not enormously complicated. Relaxing and opening, being present as part of what is occurring without chopping it up conceptually into different pieces, self, other, inside, outside, and so on. And then allowing our participation to be directed by the felt sense of the emergent field as one's own world. That is to say, I'm not from inside myself going out into this foreign world where there's a threshold just in front of me. There is no threshold. We are always in the world. We don't live anywhere else. The world is inseparable from the mind. These are not two categories. Mind and body. The spiritual, the material. These are just concepts. The actuality is, if we're not conscious, there ain't nothing there, as far as we know. And we think, oh, well, maybe there is, maybe there is. That's a, con that's a concept. Being conscious of a concept is not the actuality of something. We only have access to the world through our own mind. That is to say, the world reveals itself to us through our own participation in the world. 
So at the time of change, we can think about what sort of participation have we had here? Is there anything to learn from the quality of how we are with others? Some people are perhaps very, very busy. And in that busyness, don't give themselves enough time to hang out and relax. Other people, maybe they're always hanging out and relaxing and could have been involved in more structured activity. It's not about judging good and bad. It's just observing what are the choice points that we are aware of. In these choice points, what is the range of options that appears open to us? And as I was saying earlier, when we look at other people and we see that they seem to be ordering their life from a different menu from us, how come? If we're, if we're all in the same restaurant, then it's a damn funny waiter that gives different customers a different menu. So what, what is the menu? Actually, it's that we've got stuck in a small bit of it. So the moments of change allow us to do a kind of audit, as it were. What has transpired here between us and other people, between us and the potential of the situation? Could I have ordered something else? Could I have come forward in a different way or step back in a different way? It's, again, it's not that one should or one shouldn't. The central point is always, what am I up to? Who am I in the moment when I step into this evolving matrix, as I step forward moment by moment. What, is, what are the mental factors that determine the kind of choices I make? Are they imbued with fear? Are they imbued with shame? Are they imbued with um, anxious self-preoccupation? Are they imbued with hope? Are they imbued with a sense of entitlement, which may blind us to the actual feedback we're getting from those around us? Only we can find that out. There are many kinds of structured meditation that give you things to do again and again and again. When you sit down to meditate, observing the breath and so on, this can be very helpful. But it doesn't require all that much effort. All you're having to do is repeat a simple task. And some of the um, ritual meditations, pujas and so on, have a similar form. They're not enormously difficult to do. Because there is a, a choreography, there's a, a score that you follow and then you know where you are. Observing ourselves is much more difficult. Because we cheat ourselves. We don't really want to know. We often want ourselves to be nicer than we are. We have an image of ourselves that we try to protect. So learning to observe oneself is not going to be possible if you hate yourself. Because if you, if you are against yourself, if you judge yourself harshly, why would you tell the truth? Because you're going to get a whack. Makes sense, doesn't it? If you're in a war zone and the enemy are coming and they say, are oh, you one of us? You say, you're too damn right I am. Absolutely, 100%. Oh, yes. Why would you say, no, actually, I'm one of the enemy? Because I shoot you. So the judge in your head is just the same. How can you really know how you are? That is to, to say, observe yourself in the moment that you become yourself. If you're predisposed to allocating moral values on different forms of arising. So what I'm suggesting here is that we have to take morality out of ourselves, first of all. We can return to ethics later when we're more free to be truly present with other people. But if you have a strong map in your head about how you should or shouldn't be, it's very difficult to see then how you actually are. So by starting to be kind and loving towards yourself, 
it allows you to see what do I do. You can then see the particularity of your own manifestation and through that to make subtle changes. If you try to force yourself in a crude way, if you start to despair of yourself and, and become disappointed in yourself and feel that you're hopeless and can't do something or you let yourself down, there's something so demeaning, so bleak in that interior landscape that it's very difficult to mobilize any real energy for change. So, to make a mistake is to take something the wrong way. You can then simply put it back where you got it and take something else. That's all. It is not a fundamental sin. It is because the idea of sin is that it puts this permanent marker as if the judge was, you know, was diamond hard and would scratch the score across the surface of your being. This makes it very difficult to see, because we're frightened. Why wouldn't we be? And of course, it's grounded in objectification. I am a thing. Because I appear to be a thing, I appear to have a fixed shape. I can be known. If I can be known, I can be totalized. I can be summed up. And then, I was weighed and found wanting. That is enormously harsh. It's a it's a, a metaphor or an image, a trope which runs right through Western culture and through many, many other cultures, in which human beings can be seen as on the right side or the wrong side, on the inside or on the outside as having true value or as being a waste of space. From the point of view of Buddhism, all beings have Buddha nature. There is nobody who is unredeemable. All mistakes are contingent, adventitious. That is to say, they arrive, just as you get an advent calendar that tells you about the lead up to the time that Jesus comes. All are limitations, our bad qualities, are adventitious. They came. They came in time. They are not innate. They are not truly defining. The true nature of all beings is radiant, luminous, open, empty. We are not things. But when we're judged harshly, it is as if we are things. And then, very often, bad things, substandard things worthless things, unlovable things. That's what's particularly dangerous. So the first aspect is to, through observing impermanence, you start to see, well, where is the thingness of me? When I beat myself up and come to the familiar conclusion that I'm useless or unlovable, that beating myself up is an activity. If I wasn't identifying myself as bad and then beating myself up, I wouldn't be feeling so bad. I am making myself feel bad by beating myself up. And then when I feel hopeless and worthless at the end of it, I say, huh, so, no wonder you have to beat yourself up. You can see you're a pile of poop. A syllogism, a self-sealed line of inquiry that goes nowhere. That's why it's so important to observe the content of our mind, but with hope. We are not a thing, not fixed. Therefore, everything you say about yourself is a temporary labeling, which may or may not be accurate to the particular situation, but can have no enduring truth. So if we say, I'm very selfish, that may be true from time to time. From time to time, you may be quite determined to get your own way. 
I have a certain skill early in the morning getting a seat in the tube in London. <laughs> I'm like a little ferret. I can sniff the seat out. I'm standing there watching who's twitching, who's about to get up. <laughs> because my bum deserves that seat. <laughs> you, you, on one level, that's a kind of selfishness. It's saying me first. There are other people standing. After you, Claude. No, after you. No, thank you. I'm Scottish. I'll have a seat. <laughs> So we can be aware of these patterns in ourselves. It depends what's at stake in the circumstances. It's what conclusion we derive from that. If we say it's bad to be selfish, I am selfish, therefore I'm bad. You've got a very quick little circle going there, haven't you? So when, when we need to be quite wary at that point, that the accurate perception of a behavior is allowed just to be that. That's an accurate perception. I have done something in which I privileged my comfort over the comfort of other people. Yeah, I did that. That's all. What conclusion should be drawn from that? There is only one conclusion, that I did something that privileged myself over other people. That's all. It's a description. The description has a flavor to it. But if you distill that and distill it down to one intense drop of bile that says, I'm a bad person because I did that, what, what does that develop in ourselves? Often a feeling of a stuckness in a behavior. Because if you know it's something I did, next time you can choose to do it differently. You don't always have to do it. But sometimes it might be important. Because if you sit down, you might have some papers to read before you get to work, and that might be useful for other people. It's again and again seeing the impermanence is about the unique specificity of the moment in the action, and it's just that. It doesn't distill anything else. It doesn't create anything else except itself. If you choose to recruit it as proof of some general theory that you have about your value as a human being, that's another activity. And you have to think, well, why am I doing that? Because maybe as a child, your parents told you you're selfish, or you're greedy, or you're lazy. And that becomes a kind of core motif, an organizing view of yourself that demands to be reinforced by repetition. Repetition is how things continue through time. There's no other way for them to continue. You have to revisit that one. So, from the point of view of practice, in order to become truly ethical, the first step is to really forgive yourself. Forgive yourself in order to open up the freedom to inquire precisely into what you do without fear and through that to start to see what are the driving forces that cause me to act in that way. Is it an internally driven? I was saying earlier there's no difference between internal and external. In English, we describe it in this way. Does it feel like something arising, as it were, from me out to the world? Or does it appear to be something about the world? For example, if, say, you have a fear of confrontation, if your parents fought a lot or whatever, or you had a bullying kind of parental figure, and confronting is, is scary for you and you don't like to do it and you also don't like it because when people confront you you experience that as an aggressive action but you understand that your child is having a bad time at school from the teacher you have to go into the school and say something to the teacher you have to do something which you think is not a good thing to do what does that mean? It means that your ethics is contextual. 
in itself confronting other people and you know fronting them often carries a kind of aggression inside it because it's a sort of winning and losing structure it's not really collaborative activity however sometimes it has to be done if you don't confront a bully they're likely to continue bullying therefore the meaning of the action is in the context and the context is linked to the intention it can't be in the structure of the activity itself generally saying generally speaking we might say anger is unhelpful nobody benefits from anger so that that may be true to a certain extent however if somebody is doing something bad and you are being angry can stop them then maybe that anger is useful that's the important thing is that if we have too strong an internal definition and our freedom to respond to the situation is held in the clenched fist of our own past conditioning we won't be able to see the situation clearly and we won't be able to mobilize accordingly that's why taking super ego or heavy patriarchal morality moralizing out of one system is very helpful because it allows us to to be able to see what is on what is going on it doesn't mean the end of ethics because actually patriarchal morality and ethics are two very opposite categories ethics requires the sense of how shall I respond in this situation as a subject among subjects ethics is concerned with intersubjectivity morality is often concerned with aligning yourself to the dictates of a power induced system in Buber's terms it's more a, an I it than an I thou especially because if you don't conform then you can very clearly be labeled as the it as the object to be overdetermined and conditioned and punished and so on so this is why when we sit to practice in an open way it allows us to experience how we are with ourselves am I kind to myself am I thoughtful to myself am I friendly what am I up to with myself what is my internal world what is well, it's not really internal but what is the nature of the dialogue out of which I am constituted and the more we see that the more we can really have a sense of the possibility that all the core sense of being wrong being bad being limited is the product of repeated activity rather than a deep essence which can't be changed most religions have some kind of view like this the question is of course how do we do that how do we achieve purification you can go do confession and go to the catholic mass you can go on pilgrimage every religion has many many methods of saying the bad which seems to adhere to me needs to come off from the buddhist point of view it's by seeing that there is no continuous essence in the person and that all that we take to be wrong is generated out of the interaction with the environment rather than an innate state we start to release the negative factors which are going on this is the root of the of the practice is to be kind to yourself and through being kind to yourself you're kind to other people kindness doesn't let mean letting yourself off the hook but it means not putting yourself on the hook because being hooked is not very helpful we it's 
you cannot see by coercion. This is one of the big issues, isn't it? When President George W. Bush says he supports waterboarding, we can only hope that someone will give him his own waterboard for Christmas. <laughs> To, to think that coercion leads to the truth is something that we moved away from after many, many hundreds, hundreds, and in fact thousands of years of so-called civilization development. That by branding people, cutting bits off their body, breaking their limbs, crushing their bones, you would somehow bring them to tell the truth. In Roman law, if a slave was to give evidence, it was always important to torture them first so that the fear of more torture would ensure that they were telling the truth. Generally speaking, we start to think that's a bit strange. In the same way, putting the squeeze on yourself is not going to help. Fear doesn't really help. This is the movement, many different interpretations of this, but generally speaking, from the Old Testament to the New Testament, from Yahweh to a, a more uh, forgiving God. A, a punitive God is one who's going to call you to account. A more tolerant God is one who allows you permission to start again. So, in being kind to oneself, it's about observing the pattern of being lost to see how do I function? What is the basis for me getting tight and out of that tightness cutting myself off from the broadest field of my existence and acting in an intense way in which my goal is something which seems very, very important but is actually quite small. So many people act in despair, cut themselves, have a suicide attempt, you know, drink a bottle of gin and then throw themselves out the window. This happens every day in Britain. Somebody gets to a limit where they can't bear themselves. It, it's, isn't it just unbelievable? Suicide is, is something unbelievable. That somebody could so objectify themselves, so reduce the potential of their existence, so be so alienated from themselves that their only way of continuing is to kill themselves as the only path of freedom. There is something so desolate, so abysmally lonely about that. And But we all have some potential to go in that direction through the nature of objectification. As soon as you make yourself a thing, you then start to attribute value, good or bad. And once you get into a, a role of attributing negative value to yourself, you can enter into a spiral that goes down and becomes hopeless. So what we're looking at just now is something which is of value, I hope, in, in our own lives, but clearly it also helps us to see the dangers in the world around us. But whenever people are told who they are by other people, whether it's people of minority races or religions or children with particular kinds of defects or tendencies, and they are then corrected, it's a problematic world. We see this more and more. The you know, bipolar uh, affective disorder is the fastest growing mental health condition in Britain today. It's now being a diagnosis that is increasingly people are wanting to apply to children. In America, if you're age three years of age, you can be identified as having bipolar disorder and be given very, very powerful medication. It is mind-boggling. It is mind-boggling. Because they have an essentialized reading, this child has something wrong with it. Rather than people saying, this child needs a bit more love or a bit more attention, or how will we behave with this child, there is some demon inside this. It's a, it's a psychotropic form of, of exorcism. It is a, it's a ghastly business. But again, it's, we do the same to ourselves. Whenever you give a very strongly negative reading of yourself or someone else, or even on the other extreme, 
if you go into idealization and you think somebody's completely wonderful. Because, of course, if somebody's wonderful, someone else has got to be shit. And so the over-intensification of the reading doesn't allow the shadow of the good person. And then people feel let down and disappointed. We are all complicated. We all have many, many aspects to us. Some radiant, some rather diminished. Learning to inhabit the, f the incredible complexity of our existence in a field shared with the incredible complexity of other people's existences requires a lightness of touch, an openness, a sensitivity, a quickness of response. That's very difficult if we hate ourselves. And especially if we're frightened of other people and we want to control them in order to make our world safe. The, the, the defences are always quick and easy, but they rarely work. They rarely work, and they just make the situation worse. So, when we sit, when we say the simple instruction, just relax and open, this is something actually quite amazing. This is an invitation to be yourself and to allow yourself to be yourself as you are, beyond any map or interpretation. And the more we do that, and you can do it, build up, you can sit for hours in that way. The incredible diversity of your potential starts to be revealed to you, which can then be manifested in the different situations that you encounter. So it's not about going from order to chaos, we are not chaotic because we are ordered through time. One form arises, then another, then another, then another. When we get overwhelmed, it's because we are, in that moment, attached to a limited view of ourselves. When the mind is open, it is infinite. So any kind of weird stuff can arise for a while, and then it's gone. And then you start to realize, I don't get overwhelmed. I can be there with this. Any thought about myself, any thought about other people, is simply a thought. It has no definitive truth inside it. It's a gesture, which may be accurate or inaccurate, but it doesn't have defining force. That way there's a lot of freedom. So maybe we do a little bit more of that practice. And then we can take some questions and end for the day. Okay. So maybe take a few minutes and just uh, discuss with the neighbor you know, what, any of the points from what we've done already today and see if it gives rise to any questions or things you want to open up more. Okay, uh, so... <coughs> See if there are any thoughts or questions you want to raise. Well, that's interesting. <clears throat> so, a thought, maybe you suddenly have a thought about what's happening in London. You're not in London now, 
but that then hooks lots of other things very quickly. So one thing arises and many others arise. And you know, the, not my favorite topic, but in, in neuro research, you know, it, it does appear that when the, um, a family of thoughts ar arise together and then one breaks the surface. But, but you know, it is patterns of potential thoughts which arise. All of these are in the, in the present moment. They relate to the past. When you think of London, London is here. There is no London anywhere else for us. London elsewhere is an idea. The felt sense that, that London can get you because of connections you have with London is here and now. The question then is, where is that? I mean, you say you build it up, or it's a backdrop. Where is it? I don't know. It's something that's playing around all the time, and I can't um, get rid of it. Nor did I think it was my purpose to get rid of it. I sit with it. It's, it arises. I've been here before. I'm sitting. <coughs> it's a fresh moment, but it's, I know this place because I've been there before. Well, but have you been there before? To, to say I have been in Macclesfield before, for me personally, is a fact and also a lie. It's a lie because the Macclesfield I'm in now is not the same Macclesfield that was here when I was here before. But it is a fact that formally, in formal terms, it is a fact I have been in Macclesfield. When I came to Macclesfield, this is only the second time I've been to Macclesfield, when I got, got off at that train station, I did not get off that train as though I'd ever been to Macclesfield. I might have wanted to. Yeah. Last time I came, there was thick ice <coughs> on that platform. Today, there was a fine dust of, of snow. And I thought, oh, that's different. The last time I came here, it looked like this. Now, there's you know, fine sprinkling of snow, and I walked up the same alleyways. No, no, they weren't the same. They were different alleyways. Mm -hmm. But with all the history, and I couldn't walk up that alleyway. That's right. Because genuinely, I've never travelled up that alleyway before. I've travelled up with a residue. I've been up this alleyway before. Yeah, but the, the memory of walking up the alleyway was in the moment there with you as you were walking up the alleyway. Yeah. You didn't go into the past, as it were, the past was with you, but not as the past. To recognize something is its presence in the moment, isn't it? Okay, but isn't that, because for me, there's something about um, some heaviness sometimes in practice. And I, I think of the heaviness as being, it's not just about whether I chase thoughts or not. I think of the heaviness as being the residue of all my life experiences that are just self-arising in the moment. And it feels like there's naturally attachment in that. But the build-up of knowledge has intrinsically attachment in it, whether I run after it or not. Yeah, that's what it feels like, because you're actively attaching yourself to it. It feels as if the attachment is in the object, but the attachment is always in the subject. For somebody sitting in a bar in Buenos Aires, London doesn't mean anything except this fucking nation that stops them getting their island back. 
you know, they haven't been to London, they don't want to be in London. You've been in London. So it's, it's our subjectivity which makes the object sing. It may appear to be out there. When children look at television on a Saturday morning at this particular period of time, they're bombarded for every five minutes of entertainment with ten minutes of adverts. You know, what I want for Christmas, what I want for Christmas. And the child's looking at that and saying, I've got to have that. Now, it looks as if the object out there has the power. But they are being inveigled into building up a subjective tilt towards that piece of tat to make it shine. There's very little value in most of these kids' games. The cheap bits of plastic. But the child then starts to think it has real meaning, it has real value. And that the value is in the object. The value is always in the subject. And, and that's the difficult thing. We project the value into the object, then see it as being inherently in there, whether it's a negative value or a positive value. And then it appears, oh, it's out there. I mean, sorry, accumulation of experience um, is, is a positive thing, it's not. I mean, it's again, but if you use language like accumulation of experience or a, a residue, <clears throat> you know, if you're out gardening and you, you wash your tools in a bucket of water, the muddy water will gradually settle down, there'll be a residue at the bottom. Is that really how our memory works? I mean, it can feel like that. We seem to go back in time and it was as if, as if I was there. It, it feels like that. But actually, we are always in the moment. We cannot be anywhere else as I was trying to indicate earlier, you're either in the fresh moment or the, the occluded moment, the covered over moment. And that is a moment in which we are absorbed in a thought. Now, if you watch a movie, you go into the movie and it's as if you're in France or in Italy or in India. But you're not. You're in a cinema or sitting at home watching a DVD. But it is as if, the same when you read a novel, <clears throat> and it's exactly the same process when you're walking from the station into Macclesfield, the movie in your mind is playing, I've been here before. That's not a bad movie to have because it helps you to get where you need to be more quickly. But where have you been before? It gives you the abstract coordinates for navigating a city you know the rough shape of buildings, and so on. It's a very imprecise knowledge. It's, in that sense, it's non-phenomenological. It's not located directly with the phenomena as they present themselves to us. It's based on abstraction. So the knowledge that we have of situations is abstract. Because what is actually there, and, and the, our abstraction, exists in a a particular kind of relationship which is not one-to-one. -one. That is to say, you could take a piece of paper probably and draw roughly the road back to where you're staying, but that wouldn't tell you anything about what you will encounter in walking down these roads on your way. So it's telling you about a general something which isn't anywhere except a map in your head. That map in your head has some sort of correlation, some sort of relationship with what's out there. But what's out there is itself unknowable before it appears. For suddenly a car appears, and there's a drunken driver, and they crash, or this or that. We have no idea. Nobody ever can know that. Which is why the automatic pilot is so dangerous for us. It's both a basis for a huge amount of ease in our lives, that we can indeed have that sort of knowledge, but it's a knowledge that can make us blind to the very moment that we're living in. So the whole of life can be automated, and you just get through it. The day's gone by, and another day's gone by. That's the danger. So it's the, the patterns are there, but they are there in the present. Where do they come from? Well, then we have the more general thought. Where do thoughts come from? Do they come from the past? 
If so, who sends them? Do they put enough stamps on them? Because I've got some thoughts from the past I quite like to remember. As I get older, bits of my memory are falling off. So I'd like the post office of the good years in my life to send a few more messages. <laughs> Where is the past? So it's all floating around in awareness, is it? Well, it, it's, not, it's not born until it's there. It's, uh, it's not exactly latent. You might say it's a potential, but that particular thing arises. It arises when it's contextually evoked. It comes from emptiness. I mean, in, in some schools of Mahayana Buddhism, they talk of the alaya vijnana as a storehouse consciousness and they say that all the events that have ever occurred for any sentient being are stored in this great consciousness and that we have a degree of access to that and from that we can we pull up ideas and sometimes of course we get ideas that have nothing to do with that so we get strange dreams and we suddenly have an obsession about something that, well, where did that come from that's one view or you can say it comes from emptiness itself. But if you have not come back to Macclesfield, the particular pattern of your route from the station to the place where you were going would probably not have crossed your mind. There would be no reason for it to do. But should you do that, it would be there. So where where are where are these structures? They're not anywhere. Nothing is anywhere. Everything is always in the same place, which is the open dimension of being, into which we put all our language gaze. It is this, it is that, it's right, it's wrong. It, it is mind boggling. We have these rational interpretations where we join the dots and we make these little interpretive storylines. But actually, if the past has gone, and yet it's still with me, what is with me? In therapy, people can go into a regression, and it is as if, manifestly, they are there. When they were five years of age, and the voice can change and all the rest of it. Um, when Charcot was doing his uh, hysterical studies, or his study of hysterics in Paris, <laughs> fairly hysterical as well, he, he had that manifesting in a very clear way, people behaving, just completely embodying something that would be evoked. And the soldiers with PTSD say that, you know, they, they wake up and they're under the bed, protect themselves from bombs which are arising in a reactivated memory. Now, there's no bombs in the room, but it is as if that's happening. But we say it is as if. For them, it is happening. And that's the terror of it. It's like having a small child who has a nightmare. They wake up screaming, and it's real. And it takes quite a lot of work sometimes to get them into realizing it's just a dream. Because when it's there, it's there. And this is very, very important for thinking about how we get trapped. You know, because when you sit in the meditation, say you're doing the one about focusing on the breath or something like that, and you vanish into a thought. How did that thought catch me? I had decided I wouldn't do it, and yet I did do it. Or people who have strong repetitive patterns, let's say they suffer from bulimia, will find themselves at home with a fridge stuffed with food that they don't remember buying. A sort of fugue-like state of the, if you like, neurotic decision to, to vomit that night, to binge and vomit, that, that created its basis before they had a choice to think about it. It just happened. So all of these states are very interesting for examining how, if our subjectivity slips into being merged with a thought, it is as if there is no choice. It's just that. I'm sure we all experience that in various ways. It's quite frightening. Where is our existential freedom? Where is our sense that we're rational beings making choices when we're caught? We're not being caught by demons, as people might have thought about it in the old days. There is no magician putting weird ideas in our heads. This is 
this wide expanse of all the past events which exist there and suddenly arise like a kaleidoscope in ever new patterns and we're in it which is why the struggle to be more conscious in many ways doesn't help because what you've got is two orders of existence one is immediate and automatic and the other is conscious and reflective and they don't actually touch which is why relaxing and opening with a relaxed awareness which is not the enemy of the arising nor is it the merged ally of the arising but is present with the arising is I think the best way through that but it, it's tricky it's very very strange our world is not what we thought it was That's right. That's right. I mean, our world it organizes itself in the tantric system. They, they demonstrate this by these mandalas, which are everywhere. Mandalas are very patterned, clearly patterned, organized structures in the four directions with a central point with different colors and symbols, all of which operate harmoniously together. That's seen as the always organized matrix out of which the apparent randomness of this world manifests. That beneath this world there's, a, there's an infinite mandala. That's a symbolic way of thinking about this. That our, our particular luck in this life is to be following the patterns that we follow. A bit like the Australian Aboriginal idea of soul line that you have to walk these particular paths every year and sing the songs that go with it in order to keep these things alive. A bit like the Ramblers Association trying to walk into <laughs> the field song. But we do the same. Why do we repeat things? Because we are reaffirming the, the intensity of that groove or that marker that confirms this is my world. Our world is made up of repetition and randomness. What is never repeated is the exact moment, but the patterns are repeated. And the patterns can be neurotic, compassion-based, but whatever we do will always be patterned. I mean, we, we, even people in extreme states of psychosis, you could, if you hang out with them, you get, you get a fair sense of how they're going to be. There is a pattern to everything in life. There is no essence. A pattern doesn't impute an essence. A pattern is a pattern. It's a bit like listening to music. If you listen to the Goldberg variations, where you get variations on these few kind of key motifs, it's going, the, it goes on and on and re revealing and going round and round all the possibilities in this small pattern. And it unfolds itself in time. There is no essence to it. There's nothing that you can grasp, but you can participate in that beautiful sequence of patterns. In the same way, if you go and see people who you've known for a long time, it's likely that quite a lot of your conversation will be similar to what you had before. Because with that person, you have that kind of a conversation. And these, these are the patterns of our existence. There is no... Uh, core, there is no essence in them, but the repetition creates the sense of familiarity out of which we think, ah, oh, back here again, ah, oh, it's good to see you, and there's a sense of there's somebody really there, and it's really good to see them, and what's actually happening is repeated movements of activity. Who, the person that we're talking to is somebody who can play this game of ping pong with us, because we make an allusion to something, they were there, they make a counter allusion. We say, oh, yeah, that was great. And remember, da -da 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 -da, bing, 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 the ball doesn't jump off the table. That's what a good conversation with an old friend is like, isn't it? It's dynamically unfolding. And you are creating something in the moment 
But the felt sense is we were talking about that which was real because we were both there. So you have a reified or an essentialized, a concretized discourse interpretation when what was actually happening was ephemeral, fleeting, and gently nourishing of our sense of the predictive order of the world. Well, that's one, that's one form of enjoyment. That's enjoyment as, we need to stop in a minute, but that's enjoyment as a reassurance, isn't it? And re reassurance, and, and there's the enjoyment of seeing something new, there's the enjoyment of something familiar. But you can enjoy something you don't know. Some people are anxious about the new, and so they prefer the comfort of the familiar. Some people are bored by the familiar and seek the excitement of the new. You can enjoy both, depending on your disposition. So, I think you can, you can enjoy things you don't know. Part of the enjoyment of the old is that it is confirmatory of the ego sense, I know who I am, and this is my life. Which is not bad on a good day, but on a bad day, the world whacks you, and, and it's terribly troubling, because what what you expected doesn't occur, and then you're shocked. So, it's whole, it's, it's, the middle way is to hold the pattern lightly, to see it as a pattern in which one participates, but the pattern is not the proof that it will continue through time. Just as this Dharma Center is not continuing here through time, but we have had, some of us, a pattern of meeting here in various ways through time. These patterns gave a sense of knowledge, prediction, familiarity with certain people and so on, all of which is real, but doesn't speak of any power of defining the continuity. Because the continuity of the pattern is dependent on dependent co-origination on so many factors. And we often... In, you know, just as I was suggesting earlier, because Britain used to be a very big, powerful colonial power with a lot of money coming in, that doesn't mean that we can continue to be Great Britain with a huge army and navy and air force and this, that and the other. At a certain point, the gap between the historically developed narrative and what is actual starts to become frighteningly obvious. You suddenly think, whoa, whoa it, it doesn't compute. And that happens in families as well, doesn't it? When your kids become teenagers, you suddenly think, who is this? And what are they doing in my house? <laughs> when are they leaving? <laughs> because they're not who you thought they were. It's quite something. Okay, well, we can continue with uh, some of this exploration and practice tomorrow morning at 10. But for the moment, for those who like, it's going to the pub down the road and then we'll come back and have a bit of time together. If we start just with some quiet sitting. Just focus our attention easily on the breath as it flows in and out. Um, and if you find your mind wandering off, just gently bring it back to that focus. And we sit like that for a while just in order to settle and arrive.
in uh, most of the schools of Tibetan Buddhism, there is a, <coughs> a concept which is very important for thinking about our existence. It's called the two truths, and there's a chapter uh, about it in this uh, book, Simply Being, which illuminates it in some detail. Essentially, it, it's uh, uh, describing two aspects of our existence. One is called the relative truth, the other is called absolute truth. The relative truth is a conventional truth, uh, a truth of interpretation, and the absolute truth is the truth of how things are in themselves. So, relative truth is concerned with how we make sense of the world. And one of the things that human beings do is they divide phenomena into the categories of sacred and profane. So, in a town like Macclesfield, you'll have churches, probably a mosque, synagogues, and Buddhist center. You could say that these are sacred places. These are places where people go to develop their spiritual life. In a town like Macclesfield, you have pubs, probably brothels, all sorts of places that might be considered very profane. These are conventional interpretations. And we are here in this room at this time watching the sacredness drip, drip, drip out of this building. This building is in the process of becoming profane. <laughs> How did it become sacred in the first place? By a particular orientation of mind, a particular way of thinking. We are going to make a special place for meditation. And then you have statues, and the statues get filled with mantras, and then there's some blessing practices to make this holy and special. It's not so very different from the consecration of a church. And then as the Church of England has become less popular, churches become deconsecrated and turned into houses. So, sacredness is temporary and conventional. When the factors of its maintenance are there, it can continue for a very long period of time. But when the factors of its maintenance are not there, it can ebb away. Does this matter? What is the real difference between the sacred and the profane? One of the things is, it's a different kind of performativity. That is to say, when you go into a sacred place, you do something different. There was a picture in the newspaper last week of Her Majesty the Queen in the Middle East, walking about with her shoes off and a little scarf on her head, and a, and a little pillbox hat. Pillbox hat was actually quite cute, <laughs> because she was going into a mosque. So she behaves differently as a mark of respect, and you know, most religious situations of that, some you put your hat on, some you take your hat off, you do different kinds of things. You stand up. Some churches you stand up to sing, and you sit down to pray. Other times you stand up to pray, sit down to sing, you, or you kneel to pray. Rituals establish how we're moving between the, choreograph, the choreographed uh, behaviors which indicate we're not in free fall. We're not in the movement of things according to our whim. We have to be on our best behavior. One of the things I had to learn as a child when I went to church with my parents was how to take the peppermints out of the sporran that I had on my little kilt and get them into my mouth without crackling the paper. This was seen as a very spiritual practice, not to disturb other people. So in that way you learn there are certain things to do, certain things not to do. What that can be a form of discipline. It can bring a particular kind of clarity to a situation that by knowing in advance how I have to behave, the other possibilities of behavior 
which in terms of this fixed form of behavior are distractions, are then prohibited in some way. Just as when we do the meditation, if we're focusing on the breath, as soon as we decide to do that, all the other movements of the mind become considered to be distractions. If we weren't observing our breath, they wouldn't necessarily be distractions. And if you're doing a, a ritual worship and you have to ring your bell at certain times or bang a drum or move your hands in particular ways, doing them at the right time in the right way is deemed appropriate, correct. And doing other things would be deemed to be wrong. The other things that you might do are not wrong in another context. So through this, we start to see that the sacred creates context-specific behaviors. It is a human construct. From the point of view of absolute truth, there is no difference between the sacred and the profane. You don't need to have a Dharma center to do practice. You don't need to know any uh, Tibetan language to do practice. You can learn these things. It can be useful. The essential point is the relationship with yourself, whatever you are doing. Under all circumstances, at all times, who am I? Where am I? What am I doing? What is occurring? That's the essence of a path of awakening. It doesn't really require any props. When we use props, we have to realize that these are methods, methods which we are making special, that we buy into. Just as if you go to see a psychoanalyst, you lie on a couch. If you go to see a psychodynamics psychotherapist, you probably sit facing them. Because the different models of therapy encourage different behaviors. You go to see a gestalt therapist, you might be sitting on the floor in a cushion. These are ritualized ways of behaving, which essentially define the nature of what we're doing. It's not that because I'm a psychoanalyst, I want you to lie on a couch. It's lying on a couch indicates to the world I'm a psychoanalyst. Because if I was a gestalt therapist, I wouldn't be asking you to lie on the couch. The behavior generates the essence, as it were. So we're back here with Sartre's dictum about the, the different readings between whether experience generates a, a kind of essence or whether there is an essence prior to experience, whether you have existence giving rise to an essential notion of who we are, or whether we have an innate essence which gives rise to our particular existence. So from an existentialist point of view, it's the thrownness into the world that we're born into a particular family at a particular time. You go to a particular school, it's your luck to get a particular teacher, reading comics, watching the telly, whatever it would be. All of these are just the, f the factors of existence which are thrown at you and which in relation to trying to catch them or trying to avoid them, you develop your range of responses. So out of the particularities of your existence, which is a dynamic movement of interaction with the environment, you come to be the person who you are. And then you think, that's just me. This is who I am. But it, is, it has arisen due to causes and circumstances. You can turn it the other way around, as we often do, and we think, well, I've always been like this. This is how I am. It's because I'm like this that I do these things. There you have an, the perception of an essence which generates the manifestation of these kinds of behaviors. That latter reading makes the participation in an open field of change much more difficult. Because if I really have an essence, something which defines me, if I lost it, who would I be? Therefore, my job becomes the task of protecting my essence in order to maintain my identity, which is the shaping of my existence. So it becomes very important how one understands this. And from the Buddhist point of view, and which has many, many similarities with an existentialist view, the givenness of our life, that is to say, what we encounter, 
is the field in which we come into formation. We are lucky, we people in this room, that our lives have probably been very little touched directly by war. For most of us, the war was over before we were born. And unless our families are connected with the military, we haven't had too much direct connection. For people who are a bit older than us, their lives were greatly, greatly affected by the war. And if some tragedy happened again, again, that would implicate people's lives. So we can see that causes and circumstances generate the particular feel of what seems real to you. And in your participation in that field, you come to appear in a particular way to yourself and to other people. And because we tend to be um, rather concerned about our good name, our sense of how other people see us and what they think of us, there's always a peer pressure. There's always a, a, a kind of sensitivity or even anxiety in ourselves. Am I behaving in a way that will ensure that other people will like me or tolerate me or certainly not kill me or attack me? What do I have to do in order to survive? What's important there is to see how if you put a line of fear down the center of your existence, then you are attuned to what's going on around you, but there's a very selective sort of attention. Because you've got a sense of, here I am, this is my shape. How can I work the field how can I act to manage the forces around me in order to optimize the benefit that I can have while being me? That's the ego's task, and it keeps it very, very busy. What we were looking at yesterday is much more to see ourselves in a participative field which is changing, and therefore we can change. And part of that change is to work with other people's perceptions of us to allow more freedom for us to change. Because if we're going to change and we live in any kind of family system or work system, our change is likely to be met by some resistance. Because other people's perceptions of us is part of their existence for themselves. Does that make sense? Yes. So if you're a parent and your kids start to behave a bit wild, you're upset as a person. Because your sense of the continuity of your being is that your kids are okay and they're a bit sorted and they're getting on with things. So that leads very often, if we, if we take the line of anxiety, it leads us into control, trying to make sure that other people remain in the shape that we want them in, to be in because we're using them as a prop that supports the continuity of our sense of who we are. And so that's all a bit kind of rigid and tight and fearful. If we can relax and open and think, since I have been born, I have been many, many different people. Many, many different things have happened to me. Things which I could never have predicted. When you're five, you can't imagine what it's like to be 10. When you're 10, you can't imagine what it's like to be 15. When you're 15, 20, and so on, all the way through your life. We had no idea a few years ago that our life would be like this now. So, clearly, transformation, shifts, changes in our identity have been happening all the way through our lives. And yet, we often remain rather fearful of these changes. As if the change were coming from something outside ourselves, acting on us, and forcing us to be what we don't want to be. Which is why yesterday we were looking at the, the nature of enjoyment, that participation in the world moment by moment, if it has a fullness of present, has a quality of enjoyment. And that enjoyment allows us to um, be there without without splitting ourselves down the middle and making a comment on what we're doing or imagining that we should be somewhere else doing something. You know, 
might think of that in the uh, classical descriptions of the maternal reverie. So that when a, a mother has a small baby, in some ways the mother is caught by the baby. The mother is imprisoned by the baby. The mother's freedom to be herself and do different things has to be sacrificed into the service of the small baby. So feeding time, maybe the baby gets a lot of wind and doesn't settle. The mother's main choice is, how can I find a way of giving myself to the baby and not seeing it as an intrusion into my life, a hellish demand, and so on. And of course nowadays, for many people, as we get older in life, we have aging parents and we end up doing a similar thing. So if somebody is demented, if you're feeding them, that can also take a very long time. They might be just on liquids and you're having to spoon it in very, very slowly and it dribbles and you have to do it again. There's something about, this is my life. Because if you have a thought, I shouldn't be here, it shouldn't be like this, why am I having to do that? All these self-serving thoughts make it extremely difficult. But it's, in many ways, it's just like being with a small baby. It's just, this is it. And at that point, thinking about it, contextualizing it, interpreting it, doesn't make any sense and doesn't help. If this is it, this is it. Here I am, and for the next hour, this is what's going to be going on. And if you can do that, there's the possibility that through the presence there can be a kind of enjoyment. It's not going to be a ha ha hoo hoo enjoyment, but it's going to be just the quality of attunement, which brings, of course, a tenderness of heart, which is vital for the opening of, of wisdom and awareness. The fact that how I am is in the service of another, that if I can forget myself into the task, there is just this. There is an absolute simplicity in being present with whatever has to be done. So here we can see that the more we are caught up in interpretation, in planning, in control, in efficiency, the more difficult it is just to surrender into life as it is. For some people that surrender will be the surrender into their own sickness. Some people have inca incapacitating illnesses which mean they're going to end up in wheelchairs or have difficulty breathing and so on. How to endure that? That would be a normal way of thinking of it. This is awful. I'm so sad to hear about that. That would be very difficult. Of course, on one level, that's true. But for the person who is in it, the task surely can be more than enduring. It's about inhabiting. If this is my, ex my existence, if that is a fact, why would I be in resistance to a fact? This afternoon, I will take the train to London, ice willing and so on, and I will have to be at the station in time for the train. The train leaves on time, therefore I have to be there in time for the train. That's a fact. If you're late, you can't call the police and have them stop the train driver and have them reverse. It's not possible. It's just a fact. In the same way, being sick is a fact. Aging parents are a fact. Children are a fact. Unemployment is a fact. It's what the, the shape of our life is determined largely by events outside ourselves. But the ego is determined to sit in the driving seat and be in charge. And so a great deal of our practice is about shrinking the ego, not to annihilate it, not to see it as bad, but to see it as a delinquent force or a potentially delinquent force like a teenager who needs more parental control who needs to be told you are a child you need to ask for permission you are not the boss in this house you cannot speak to your mother in this way that's it <coughs> because then 
then the ego is directed towards it, the functions which are appropriate to its status. Being in charge of your life, if that is governed by the rapid thoughts which generate what we call our ego, our felt sense of self, is, a, is a constructed out of the particular patterning of our thoughts. That intensity of self-perception becomes very, very problematic. Because actually, when we relax, when we're just present, maybe doing a bit of gardening, looking after children or grandchildren, cooking, there's not much to think about. So if you lower the amount of thinking, you find yourself back in the flow of existence. And that quality of your existence is not egoic. You don't have to have a self-referential commentary while you're cooking. Because you can have more of an aesthetic appreciation. The different textures of the vegetables and so on as you're cutting them. The sounds that they make as the knife slices into them. Cutting a potato and cutting celery is very different. The way the juice might spray out of them. The smells and so on. There is the immediacy of that, just as there is the immediacy of talking with an old person or with a child or with colleagues at work. This is the way in which the difference between the sacred and the profane can be collapsed. Because what could be more, as it were, sacred than giving full attention in a simple way to a situation? Because then the fullness of the situation, whatever it is, is available. That's like returning to the Garden of Eden. You're not having to work out what to do. There is a kind of givenness to it. So, what is the, the, the heart nature of what's called the absolute truth of things as they are? It's emptiness and ungraspability. One of the things about our world is that it changes moment by moment. Last night we were here, there was some music playing, we are chatting and so on, and then that's gone. And now we're here, and then soon this will be gone. If you're really here, it will be gone. If you're distracted, it will also be gone. There is nothing that one can do to impede the flow of time and circumstances. The choice we have is to be present fully in the moment or not. That's the main choice we have. If you're present in the moment, in a sense, that's what we can call sacred. And if you go to a traditional Catholic church and you watch the priest conducting the Mass, or you go to a Greek Orthodox or Russian Orthodox church, these very, very beautifully choreographed ritual gestures, the shifts in chanting, or in a synagogue, the way the cantor can really create a mood, these are exquisitely beautiful. Ex exquisitely beautiful what? Exquisitely beautiful movements in time. It begins, it flows, it ends. It begins, it flows, and ends. It's the same waiting in a train station, waiting at a bus station. You arrive, you're waiting, and then the bus is ready, you get on the bus and you go. Then you're on the bus, there's the beginning, then there's the middle and the end. And the whole of life is this ceaseless pulsation of little scenes which are established and then collapse. And the thing about being part of the Eucharist is that the sacred quality tends to support people in giving more attention. In a church, usually there's less shuffling and movement with that. It would be the same if you were in an opera, if they had some kind of long, kind of boring bits, people shuffle about, and then the aria starts every <laughs> Because the power of the object holds our attention. And in that locked on attention, there's more vitality. So the question for us, I think, has to be, why is it that this experience of myself as being fully present seems to be so determined by the quality of the object? 
that when something good is there, I'm all the same like if at a football match. If the play is a bit sort of desultory, kind of not much is going on, people might chat, they're looking around. And then if the ball's getting nearer the goal and there's a sort of excitement, people become very focused. Why was it not possible to maintain the same level of attention all the way through? Because we discriminate, this is good, this is special, this is rare, this is precious, this is ordinary, this is boring, ah, not really my cup of tea. If it's not my cup of tea, but it's the only thing to drink. Mm -hmm. if, it, if it's the cup in my hand, it's my cup of tea. So what has to shift in me to find enjoyment in what lands on my plate? Because that's at the heart of repairing this tear of special, not special, sacred, profane, what I like, what I don't like. How to have equanimity, an attitude which is basically welcoming and accepting to everything that comes. However, with some discernment. It doesn't mean that you're going to be stupid and you don't know the difference in qualities between things. It's just that it's not so upsetting. Because my happiness is not dependent on the quality of the object. My happiness is a contentment grounded in my openness to the situation. Because many experiences are saddening in life like having aging parents who are sick and dying. and You remember in your childhood doing things, maybe going out with your mum shopping or something, and you remember her vitality, and now there's this shriveling person fading away. Oh, well, that's autumn and winter. That's appropriate. That's what happens. That's what sickness and death is. It's not wrong, it's not bad, it's maybe not what we would like, because we want to hang on to something. In the same way, in this centre, we're now in deep midwinter. Autumn's gone, the summer of this uh, Dharma group is over, there may well be a spring and a regeneration, but at the moment it's winter. It's the dissolving of something, it's dying in its present form. That needn't be sad, but it's something one can observe. That there's a kind of withdrawal of um, the life. Just as in, in mid, late autumn, after the big flush of color in the leaves, the color starts to drain down. And then the leaves start to go into that more thinned out, browny color. So we have a sort of browning period here. That's interesting. <clears throat> if everything can be interesting in its fundamental basis, interesting because it's what is, the additional level of interesting that some things are more fascinating than others, we can start to see that is an imputation, that is an import that according to my particular history, my particular tendencies, my particular structure, I find this more interesting than that. So there's two levels. There is the basic unchanging interestingness of everything, and then there is my access to that interest. So, you know, I think in the past, uh, look, if you go in the shops, they sell lots of things you don't want. Why? <laughs> Why would the person running that shop not just stock it with things that you want to buy? Because it's very annoying. You have to look at things you don't want in order to find the things that you do want. That's because other people, in their bewildered <laughs> ignorance, buy things which you wouldn't buy. Why do they buy these things? Because these things appeal to them, but they don't appeal to you. That's really, really interesting. All of these things are reasonable. They're, people purchase them, but you wouldn't purchase them. 
So here are things which in themselves can reveal value to people for whom the object is one which is accessible, whereas many of these objects are not accessible to us. When we start to see that, it gives us the chance to think, OK, let me try to look through other people's eyes. Let me try to see what someone else might find value in. So, for example, if you've never played golf, you could always try and have a game of golf. If you've never tried, you know, if you don't go swimming, you could try going swimming again or try going to a yoga class. It's not that you have to take up any of these things, but it's to step over the threshold and have an experience of something that other people participate in. And that's one of the reasons why I printed these t-shirts. We decided on the, the image for the cover of the book. Um, thought, well, what else could we use that for? Because it's rather sweet. And I came up with the idea of doing a t-shirt. And then we had to find out where you buy t-shirts from. And then we had to find out a printer. And then we had to arrange that. And then you get them. And now I've got all these damn things. I have to try to sell them to recoup the money from doing it. And, but what was interesting was to step into a world. Because I'm not a businessman. I don't do any kind of trade things. And now I have to do that. So a whole new way of perceiving the world, a whole new different kind of negotiation. What I found is that the guys who sell T-shirts are much more polite and efficient than the people who work in the NHS. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they say, we'll send it tomorrow, and they do. <laughs> so that's a whole world where people just are efficient on the ball. Amazing. And, and it's very nice, especially as the years go by, to keep giving yourself new experiments. What is this like? Go and eat in the sort of restaurant or cafe that you wouldn't normally do. And then you start to, to become one with people. And think, well, they're living this existence. They seem to be centered in their existence. I seem to be centered in mine. My existence is relative, just as theirs is relative. I can see how they function. I can see why they might do that sort of thing, because they have that sort of background. We apply that to ourselves. Oh, I can see why I do this, because I have this kind of background. Then we understand that there is no true essence to our activities, our choices. They are just contingent. They just depend on causes and circumstances. That is to say, there is no core, deep internal definition which makes it certain that I will do what I do. When, when we realize that, it's like untying a great knot in the heart because it's just circumstantial. Just circumstantial. When I was a kid in the, in the back cupboard, they had one of these old cast iron shoe frames. And I would used to ask my mum about them. She said, well, in the war, you know, we'd have to repair our own shoes. They are sort of old leather cutter for cutting the thing. I said, well, why don't we make our shoes now? She said, well, the war's over. We don't do that. She said, well, couldn't we just make our shoes? <laughs> said, why would we do that? And there's really that sense, something that was done doesn't need to be done because that period is gone. Like most people, we'd have a garden shed that would be full of old bottles, bits of wires, because you didn't throw anything away, which was the thing of in, in the war. That mentality vanishes. People throw everything away because there's a built-in obsolescence. And there's something very particular in seeing that, that what reassures me that I am me is not something inside me, but the continuing resonance with particular patterns of behavior that were established in one time and one place. This is a way of describing what's called the absence of inherent self-nature in sentient beings. We don't have a particular true nature. That is to say, the content that makes me me can change. 
can change due to all sorts of factors. On the other hand, simultaneously, each of us is the center of the universe. So we are both, in a sense, nothing at all because we are created out of the times and circumstances in which we came into being. There's no definitive essence in that. And yet, moment by moment, here we are, and it's as if we are in the center of a, a crossroads, or if you like, the center of a mandala, and everything is radiating out from us and coming towards us. When, because when we get up and we move around, we are always in the center of what is going on. So what is that center? It's the quality of being present and registering both our movements going out towards others and others' movements as they move towards us and impact us. The nature of that presence is also emptiness. When we look for our mind, we can't find anything substantial. The mind is not a machine inside us. So here I have a watch. Inside the watch, there is a mechanism. We can take the back off and we can see all these small parts, beautifully engineered, which collaborate together to create the functioning of the watch. From the Buddhist point of view, the mind is not like that. The mind, as in the image we used yesterday, is like the mirror. Inside the mirror, there are reflections. The reflections are more like the content of the watch. That is to say, we have the patterns of our identification, what the sort of things we eat, we wear, the way we talk, the kind of friends we have. These are as uh, regular and patterned as the inside of a watch. The wheels go round at particular speeds. You've got from some friends you might phone almost every day. Others you see once a month and something like that. So you get big wheels and little wheels, and they're going at different speeds. That's on the, the level of the reflection, of manifestation. But in all these situations, who is the one who is the experiencer? Who is the subject? Is our subjectivity a thing? Is it a, a quality that I have? In being alive, I have a subjectivity. Or is rather subjectivity an open field of awareness in which there arises the experience, I exist, this is what I do. That is to say, all that I say I am is reflection in the mirror. The mirror itself is just I am. I am what? I am whatever's going on at the moment. I'm hungry, I'm tired, thirsty, happy, hot, cold, whatever. If you were walking here this morning, you're probably a bit cold outside. Now we come in here and it's rather warm. So at one moment, I am cold. A little bit later, I am hot. How does that happen? Well, it happens very easily. Just as if you take the mirror and you turn it around in the room, one reflection gives rise to another, gives rise to another. As, a ref as the mirror is turning, reflections are coming in and going out seamlessly. So, just as we sit here, thoughts, feelings and sensations are arising and passing seamlessly. That's why we say the mind is like a mirror. There is nothing to grasp, nothing to hold on to, and yet there is a continuous stream of experience. Within that experience, as part of the patterned content, just like the patterned inside of the watch, I have repeated thoughts such as, this is what I like, this is what I don't like. I know why I'm here, it's because da, da, da. So we have chains of explanation, of signification, which in operating together, confirm this is who I am. In the traditional language of Buddhism, these are like objects in a dream. This is like a rainbow in the sky. 
It's like the reflection of the moon on water, like a mirage in summertime. It's there and it's not there. In the moment that the person walking in the street thought, I am cold, that was true. But if they're sitting here in this wall, in this room, and they've just taken their sweater off, to have the thought, I am cold, would be a bit daft. Well, if you're cold, why do you take your sweater off? Oh, I'm not cold anymore. I'm hot. <coughs> well, you're very unreliable. One minute you tell me you're cold, now you tell me you're hot. What sort of a person are you? But we, it's normal for us to see that. So in, in being able to be these things, the, the, the central point is to hold the identification lightly. I mean, if you didn't know whether you were hot or cold, that'd be a problem. But when you are hot, you are hot, but not really hot. The hotness is contingent. It is not definitive of any essence. This is the <clears throat> central point of the Buddhist understanding of emptiness. It doesn't mean that things don't exist at all. That would be a kind of nihilistic view. It says, everything arises contingently, that is to say, due to causes and circumstances. I'm hot because the heating system works. I'm cold because it's an icy, chill morning outside, and if the wind blows, it's very chill. So, due to the wind and the ice, I'm cold. Due to the power of the central heating, I'm hot. But when I feel hot, it's very easy to think, well, I'm hot. Yeah, I know the central heating, never mind that, I'm hot. It's as if the this, this sensation was something about me. But actually, my hotness and the central heating are absolutely linked together. So, seeing ourselves as part of the world, experiencing the, the way we move out and influence events, and events influence us, we have this sense of this fluctuating change of our experience. And if we really see this, then you can relax into it. It's always going to be changing. Trying to stabilize it is not helpful. What I can do is within the flow, without too much anxiety, try to optimize the likelihood of things working well. So when we finish, I will have some awareness of the time, the time it need, I need to get to the station to get on the train. That doesn't mean that, that I have to uh, be strongly worrying about it, but there's a kind of rhythmic attunement that is to say, the station, the train, become more figural from being background. Like yesterday, it was just the background. On Sunday, I'll go, go back to London in the train. And today, as Sunday, the notion of the train becomes more present. So in relation to that, there's a sort of dialogic movement. There's a thought arises in relation to that. And the more the thought arises about the station, the more the station takes on a meaning for me. Tomorrow, it won't have any meaning. I won't be thinking about Macclesfield Station at all. At least I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> but at the moment, it becomes... <laughs> <laughs> at the moment, it, it becomes important. And it's very interesting just to observe that, how things arise from the background, become very big and important, and then they vanish. And that space then opens up the space for something else to be figured, and then something else, and then something else. And this is the movement of the reflections in the mirror. When they're there, this is the quality of our existence, but it's ungraspable. It, it, it's not made of things, it's made of gestures or currents, or moods. There's nothing solid to put yourself on, but you have to avail yourself of the world, be open to it, and, and get into rhythm with it, and pulsate with it. All psychiatric diagnosis is concerned with the problems of loss of rhythm. Depression is a loss of rhythm, because when somebody is depressed, they are rotating or reverberating 
to a rhythm which shifts away from the environment around them. Same with anxiety disorders. If someone has obsessive compulsive disorder and they perhaps have to clean their house, the, absolute, the felt absolute necessity of cleaning cuts into the rhythm of the other people living in the house. Someone's up and say, Mum, I'm doing the homework. No, I just need to do the carpet. Mum, you've cleaned the carpet. No, I have to do, I have to do it. So their sense of what is important, getting the vacuum cleaner up and down, up and down on a clean carpet, interrupts everyone else's life. And you can see that for all the different conditions. A person who needs to starve themselves or cut themselves. And we all have patterns like that, where the what we were talking about yesterday as associations, these are rhythms in which we attune ourselves to elements of our past, which thereby makes it difficult to be attuned into the emerging field that we actually live in. And so you get a divergency. So the, the key point of the practice is to see that rhythms Patterns, procedures, and so on, have no real truth inside them. They are not <coughs> necessary. What makes them feel necessary is our own overinvestment in them as being the building blocks of our existence. <coughs> and this is why observing other people is very helpful. Because we can see other people don't share my obsession. Why not? That is to say, what seems absolutely essential for me, if it's not absolutely essential for other people, its essentiality cannot be generated by anything which is a fundamental truth of the human condition. It is a historically derived particular tendency, like deciding only ever to wear a certain color or smoking cigarettes, or drinking a coffee first thing in the morning. These are, people build their lives on these blocks. This is what I do, I always do this. But that, there's no truth in it. It rings true, but it's not true. It's not true in the sense that it's not established anywhere as an undeniable fact, but it rings true because when you ring a bell, if it's a well-made bell, you get a very nice resonance. So the resonance of having a cigarette for the smoker rings true. If that's not in place, or the, the smoker can't get their particular cigarette, it's not quite right. And then we can see that we build our house on sand. We create our lives on our consumerist choice of particular aspects of existence. So in starting to see the relative nature or the conventional nature of what we take to be given a definitive of who we are, we can start to loosen it up, make experiments, try something new, and see that from the moment we wake up till we go to sleep, and even in our sleep, everything is activity. Activity which continues according to patterns of repetition, and these repetitions are more or less amenable to influence and to change. However, even if they can't be changed, they are empty. So these, there you've got the two aspects. Wisdom is the understanding, the direct experience. Everything is empty, like a dream. And within that, Compassion is the sense that how I manifest can be in the world, for the world, rather than self-referential and self-serving. That is to say, why do I do what I do? Well, I do this because I like doing it. Yeah, but you like playing your music very loud, and no one else in the house can really relax and enjoy themselves. You think rock and roll is very important, maybe other people don't. I don't care. Well, that's maybe part of the problem. <laughs> <laughs>
So there we're trying to help a young person to see that belonging in the family is more important than their individual choice. And being a teenager, it's a very difficult struggle for many people because they start to feel that being part of the group, unless it's their own particular peer group, is an attack on their individuality. But what is, what is the function of our existence? From the Dharma point of view, compassion is that our existence is always already in the world. The young person in their bedroom playing their music very loud is actually in their parents' house. The fact that they are in their parents' house is a fact they do not want to attend to. They want to think, I'm in my room, I do what I like in my room, get out, leave me alone. This room is in my house, I pay for everything in this house, this room is mine. But get out, it's my room. Ah! The child has to know it's both my room and not my room simultaneously. When the child does that, they start to be a bit adult. It's the same with Dharma. I'm myself and I'm part of the world. The two things are both true. But if you're only thinking, I'm real, my desire is real, how I want to be is real, you forget that you're part of the world. If you only think you're part of the world and you lose yourself, that's not much good either. It's holding both simultaneously. The fact of being in one's existence and part of existence. But one's own existence, when you examine it, is open and empty. The world that we participate in is open and empty. There is no clear boundary or barrier between the two. Because in our lives, when we look back, things have happened that we didn't want to happen. Life tumbles home. All of these events, whether we would call them good or bad, pleasurable or unpleasurable, were moments of experience. What do we take from the moment of experience? If you have a bad experience, maybe say someone breaks your heart or betrays you, you can take that up as a knife and lacerate yourself every day with it. You can cut yourself to pieces on the basis of that. Or you can leave it just as it is. This person behaved in that way towards me at that time. What can I learn from that? What better diagnostic skill can I have in trying to read other people and make sense of what they're up to? How can I look more clearly and try to see the patterns of other people? Love is blind. When you have a culture that bases a great deal of human relatedness on love, which is blind, it's not surprising that there's a great deal of distress when people get together. Love is not on that level is not very wise because actually love there means intoxication and lust and loneliness and longing and a whole melange of blind obsessions. If you really want to check someone out, you have to think, how will I see them? Best thing, introduce them to your friends. Then you see them relating to a wide range of people and you'll be able to get feedback from your friends. But of course, friends may think, oh, well, you've been on your own for a while and you met this person and they're not so great, but maybe there's a chance and so on. So, <laughs> <laughs> no. Accurate perception is very difficult to arrive at because people are doing all sorts of deals in their head. But to be in the world as it is means to really check it out. If somebody's not going to fit, they're not going to fit. It doesn't mean that they're bad or wrong. But trying to, to make something fit, a square peg in a round hole, is not a good idea. So, phenomenological attention, attending to things as they are, is the basis of both wisdom and compassion. It's the basis of ethics. Because if we can't see how people are, how can we behave responsibly towards them? If we're Seeing people always interpreted through the projections of our mind and our longing, who are they? We'll never know. So, the more we are aware that we approach other people, 
through hopes and fears, through fantasies and longings, and start to acknowledge this is my stuff. It's not wrong or bad, but just give it a place at the table. Now that belongs there, that's there. So what's here? Then another fantasy comes, another fantasy. We keep peeling them off and peeling them off. And then we get a clearer sense in the end of who the other person is. And we can, of course, apply the same to ourselves, that we endlessly tell stories about ourselves. One of the functions of psychotherapy is to give someone, a patient, enough time to bore themselves stupid with the endless nonsense stories they tell about themselves. And then they suddenly think, God, I could, I'd really go on about my mum, don't I? Perhaps you do. <laughs> uh, maybe, I, maybe I could not do that. Oh, maybe. <laughs> oh, sometimes what would it need to tell them that. Yeah. If they don't realise it themselves. They, they could, they could, do, it. They they could do it. They could do it. But it's probably more effective if they could get to a point where, where one can let go of it. But it, what you're saying is very important because, of course, you can tell a story in a releasing way or in a confirming way. You can tell about an event in the past in a way that heats it up and makes it appear as if it's still happening. Or you can tell it in a way that gradually unties the links you have with it so that it starts to drift out into the place where it really belongs, which is the past. Because it's, it's always been past. So that's, that's very important. So the, the, the key point here is to keep examining gently and clearly what am I up to? Keeping a diary is very, very helpful. Writing things down. If you catch yourself beating yourself up, just write it down. Then you think, where did these thoughts come from? Who's spoken to me like that in the past? Oh, this is an old conversation which is being revisited again and again. It appears to be true because I believe it. And I believe it because it's been going for a long period of time. Writing it down on paper then gives us a new perspective to help us think, what is the actual truth status of this? Why, why do I believe that it's true? Apart from it being said for a long time. For many, many hundreds of years it was said that it's no point in educating women because they're stupid. You'd have to be pretty brave to say that now. <laughs> but it was... It was, it was a fairly common assumption. And in, in Afghanistan, the Taliban returned to that idea. They say there's no point to send girls to school. They just do make babies and cook food. That, that's all they should be doing because we know what women are. So there you can see that getting someone's number, putting them in a box, knowing what they are, is a fundamental attack because we do not know what we are. We are a potential which can reveal itself in different ways. So if you do a Taliban in your head, if you tell yourself, you are this, you are that, you're self-imprisoning. So that's why writing these negative thoughts down and really looking at them can be shocking and then liberating. Because what is that seeming internal voice of truth? And of course, it's difficult to see something when it arises inside you because it kind of come, comes over the back and catches you. By putting it outside, maybe in a painting or a drawing, you could do it through movement in the body, writing, start to see, oh, this is a storyline, and I'm a sucker for this story. I get caught up in this. What's the meaning of it? And you can be a sucker for anything. When I was a kid, I, I really got into listening to Mrs. Dale's diary. So I would rush home from school and listen to the radio. My mum would say, I can't even listen to that. Why do you want to listen to that? But it's just something, isn't it? You know, you learn about the characters, you get pulled into it. It's how soap operas function. You get sucked into it. You get sucked into it. You give yourself over to absorption in the storyline. And just as we can do that with an external thing, you do it internally. That's really what a neurosis is. It's been caught up in a private soap opera in which these particular character positions are installed again and again. Okay, if we have a break now, then we'll do some uh, meditation and do some questions and then work towards the end.
lead us to some of that open sitting that we were doing yesterday. <coughs> Relax into the out breath, just sitting present with whatever comes. And if you find yourself getting locked in a particular thought or identification, and you feel uh, trapped in something, very gently keep your awareness with wherever you feel trapped. Don't try to move things around. Don't try to change what's going on. Just stay present and allow whatever you were caught up in to <coughs> dissolve. This is the great self-liberation of all phenomena. This is the innermost truth of impermanence. All phenomena are impermanent. Everything external, everything internal. Our experience is always changing. So whenever we get stuck, if you just sit with what you're stuck in, it will move, it will change. It always does. It doesn't remain. When things seem to continue a long time, it's because we are rebuilding them moment by moment by investing our energy in them. So if we just relax and not do anything, we'll be safer than if we do something. On one level, this feels counterintuitive because we've often been raised to do something. Something's wrong, better get on with it. So there's a sense of, oh, I don't like this. I'll do something different. Very, very quiet, and it passes. It's a bit like these adventure movies. So if you remember the old film of Kidnapped, when they're, they're fleeing from the redcoats and they're out in the Scottish heather and the soldiers are walking by. But you see this image repeated again and again in the movie. And the one thing you have to do is sit very still. And if you don't make a sound, they'll go by. You see that in nature all the time. The, the predator ap appears and the bird just goes quiet. And that way they become invisible. It's the same thing. Don't do anything. Just relax. It will pass by. So that's the heart of the practice. So let's do this for some time. <coughs> in the groups that have been meeting here, many different practices have been done. Some general Buddhist studies, some tantric practices, some sokshin, and so on. And at the time when the center disperses, it's very important to reflect on what kinds of practices you want to take forward in your life and perhaps make alliances with other people who would do the same practice, maybe meeting in each other's houses from time to time, or perhaps in other centers. All these practices have the same sort of orientation. Essentially, they're about having more clarity about how we function, more sense of more sense of um, what is necessary in order to see things clearly and the different kinds of practices will suit different people. It's always important to remember that a practice is a method. These were taught by the Buddhas and by the great yogis <coughs> as methods of helping people. We should be respectful towards the practice but essentially, the practice is there to serve you, not you to serve the practice. This is very, very important. The practice is a tool or a function to bring about a shift in your experience. It's not a burden to be carried. So, if a practice becomes burdensome to you, you could, if you have a little statue of the Buddha or a photograph of the Buddha or Padmasambhava or whatever, you can just take the, the practice book or the remembrance of the practice and just offer it back to the Buddha. Say, thank you very much for this. I've had it for a while. 
and I give it back to you. Many, many people get different teachings in different settings and situations. And very often the teachers in their enthusiasm say, this is very, very important, you must do this, you must do this every day. That's uh, their desire and their wish. What, what is available to us is usually a limited amount of time. We often also don't understand the function of the practice all that well. Why should I, say, do Padmasambhava practice? Padmasambhava is a way of bringing ourselves into direct relationship with our own nature. Padmasambhava, historically, you can say, is somebody who lived a long time ago in another country and did many amazing things in India and Tibet. But for us, if we do the small rixin or the big rixin, Padmasambhava represents our potential. That is to say, we are a little bulb and we sit in front of a full amaryllis. Woo! Big horns blowing out into the world and we sit like a little bulb. One day when I grow up, I'm going to be like that. That's what we do. But fortunately, this uh, practice is like one of these grow bags you can have for tomatoes. It makes things grow very quickly. So you can go from being a bulb to a full flower in the space of half an hour. Marvelous. So you start, I am a small lost person, and we pray to Padmasambhava. Through that blessing, we start to feel the connection. Through the connection, we do the visualization. Padmasambhava is in front of us. Then we do some mantra, then Padmasambhava dissolves into us. We merge in the same state as Padmasambhava, then we manifest as Padmasambhava. And then we try to experience the world in that relaxed openness. Everything is bright and luminous. That is to say, like the, the translucent body of Padmasambhava. So when we look around this room, what we see is color. What we imagine are walls and paint and brocades and so on. Brocade exists in our mind. It doesn't exist in the world. In perceptually. If you look at this brocade here, you know it's brocade because you know it's brocade. The brocade is not brocading. The brocade is a melange, a mixturing of many different kinds of color. And what you see is color. Onto that, you add your interpretation, it is this, it is that. There you have the interface between the two forms. In some of these tankas, you see a male and female deity in sexual union. That has many meanings, but one of it means the relationship between the perceptual field and the interpretive frame. So, when you see brocade, the potential of the color and the organizing quality of your mind come together and their child is called brocade. An unusual name for a child, but their child is called video camera. Their child is called flower. Everything is the child of the intercourse between the unique naked simplicity of the perceptual field and the habits of our interpretation. Now, because we each have our own thoughts, feelings, habits, we each live in our own world. Although the perceptual field is in many ways common and shared, our sense of what we see, because it arises from an intercourse, is unique to us. So, when we do this uh, practice of Padmasambhava, when we see everything as Padmasambhava's body, it's the practice of releasing the need to over-organize the perceptual field in terms of one's ordinary habitual categories. And the same with sound. When you hear everything as mantra, it means 
there's the basic vibration of sound itself but now I'm speaking you don't hear sound because you speak English if we invite some Chinese people in and they work in a little cafe they don't speak much English then what they're sitting here just hear sound blah, blah, blah. that's what they hear because they don't know what I'm saying how come they don't know what I'm saying when they can speak Chinese because Chinese is one set of conventional interpretation and English is another set of conventional interpretation. You hear me speaking English because you know English. If you didn't know English, you wouldn't hear me speaking English. But when I'm speaking English, it is as if you hear me speaking English because I'm speaking English. No? Where is the Englishness of the speaking? In your head. Not in my mouth. You make it English by the way you hear it. This is amazing. This is not what it feels like. You think you're hearing me speaking English because I'm speaking English. <coughs> that is to say, English is in the object. English is in the subject. Because if you didn't know English, you wouldn't get English. Very fundamental principle. And one of the really central points of this, it shows you are an active creator of the world. Your knowledge of English reveals what I am saying. That is to say, life is not just happening to you. That's why these uh, deities in, in Yabyum or intercourse are so important. There are two people. And if you notice in these Tibetan tankas, they're not doing the missionary position. They're having sex in a way that is very communicative and connected. It's not someone fucking someone else. That's very important. That is to say, the subject and the object are in this alive connected field. They are, as it were, making love. They're really connected. This is something vibrant. When we engage in the world, our own being, all that we are, is ceaselessly in intercourse with the environment. So if we are cut off, if we've got a headache and we're not in the mood, we're going to have a pretty dull experience of life. So part of the practice of meditation is to be ready for permanent sex. <laughs> Even on a Monday morning. <laughs> because that's actually what is happening all the time. You get up and you have a pee. When you're having a pee, your, the sensation of your body is revealed through your experience. You make a cup of tea. You know just when to take the tea bag out for you. If you make a cup of tea for someone else, you might leave it in longer or less time. You are working with the world. This is the function of Tantra, to see we are dynamic agents. We are part of the dynamic of the world. Subject and object are always moving together. So, when we insult ourselves, when we say, I'm stupid, I can't, I'm frightened, I'm this, I'm that, these are all ways of creating a mental wraparound which dulls the immediate vibrancy of our co-emergence or our joint participation with the world. Because this is going on all the time. This is why when we do the Padmasambhava practice, we become Padmasambhava and the world becomes Padmasambhava. Light, luminous, and revealing itself not like a movie on a screen, as it were, as something coming at us or something that we go towards, but always as a joint creation, which is really how it is. I mean, it's not so difficult to do that. You go into a part of Manchester where there are a lot of uh, people who weren't born in this country, and you stand in the shop to buy your chilies, and they're blethering away in Urdu. You know what they're saying? They're human beings, they're speaking, but you don't know what they're saying. They understand each other because they have the interpretive key. It is in the person. It is a quality of the subject. 
the world is experience revealed through the quality of our participation, which is why self-development makes sense, because what you're doing then is opening endlessly, infinitely, the, the range, the spectrum of the potential moves whereby we can make meaning in the world. Now, our own particular shaping means that there are many kinds of the w f function in the world we might not want to take an interest in. However, we have to see that the way to enter that world is not <coughs> close to it. Anybody can learn to sit in a yacht when it's out in the sea. You just have to duck when the main boom goes over and hits you. <laughs> it's, these are all things to learn. You can learn to play golf. You can learn to knit. That is to say, you enter into a language game. You learn, you enter into a particular construction, and if you have that construction, that world is revealed to you. If you don't know how to play bridge and you go along to a bridge club, you're probably completely bored. You see people sitting at a table, really fascinated by what's going on. Nothing to do with you. Then you learn the basics of bridge, and gradually it starts to become meaningful, and you, you start to feel that ease of movement. That's with everything. So, the Padmasambhava practice is designed to help us feel every door is open, because it's all empty. It's empty luminosity. And inside that, if we're successful, it's luminous. If we're unsuccessful, it's luminous. If things go well, it's luminous. If we make a mistake and we screw up, it's also luminous. It never becomes dull. This dullness is our own self-serving, self-reflective interpretation. Which is why the, the practice is about freshness and openness. So, it's very important to try to understand the function of these practices. And you can read this uh, book, the commentary I did on uh, being Guru Rinpoche, and it, it shows in many ways how to take this view forward. The key thing is we do the practice in order to become more alive. Whatever enlightenment is when you die, being enlightened when you're alive is being alive. It means not being impulsive and leaping out of your skin, not being frightened and falling back from your skin, but being in your skin as part of the world. This is what awakening is. When this uh, the person who became the Buddha of our time uh, was in the early stage of his life as, say, Prince Siddhartha. He had a kind of game plan mapped out for him. He was born into this wealthy, sort of noble family. All the things that he would be doing in his life were laid out. He was going to learn archery, the arts of war, uh, many, many courtly pursuits and pleasures were revealed to him. This was his function. And when he saw that there was another aspect of life, when he saw sick person, when he saw an old person, when he saw a corpse, he suddenly thought, I'm going to die. So what's the meaning of having this ceaseless round of pleasure, of always being caught up in picnics and riding chariots and so on, if I'm going to die. Is there any meaning to this? Or are we just passing time? From that, he renounced his uh, position. He de-rolled and took on a new role as a wandering yogi. At a certain point, he thought, being in this role is also a bit of a bugger. You don't get much to eat. You get lice in your hair. So he went, had a little bit of rice pudding, and sat under a tree and thought, an end of roles. I'm not participating from any position. I'm just going to sit here. And that was the point of his awakening. That is to say, I'm not going to be caught up within any cultural construction. I'm not going to be identified as a prince or a bum or a yogi. These are only names. These are conventions. The question is, nakedly, underneath that, who am I? And it was very simple. Just, oh, this is it. What I am is nothing to be grasped in its 
deepest or most open sense and in its manifesting sense. What I say on Monday, I will not say on Tuesday. So if on Tuesday you hurl back at me the words I said on Monday, I have to say to you, please post them to Monday. <laughs> I meant Tuesday. It's a different address. It's just like that. That's what the Buddha did all through his life. He responded situationally to two different things. So all of these practices are useful, but you have to work out which can be useful for you, given the amount of time you have available, whether there are any people living locally who you could meet and do practice together with, if that's supportive. Some people prefer to practice on their own. You know, different possibilities of Dharma practice exist. Some people will go to this uh, new room in the, in the center. Some people will choose to go to other centers. There are other teachers around. You can go in different ways. The main thing is to find out what you're looking for. Essentially, there is only one thing to look for, yourself. If you don't look for yourself, you won't find yourself. If you're looking for friendship, you might find that. If you're looking for a chance to learn how to chant and do things, you might do that. If you're looking for some interesting initiations, you might get that. Getting these things will be interesting, but it will not be the same as getting yourself. Who are you? The heart of the practice, whether it's analyzing phenomena, looking at impermanence and dependent origination, developing a bodhisattva vow to be available for all beings, <coughs> entering into the practice of Tantra and understanding visualization as the creative expression of your own infinite source of potential, and then using that uh, creation as a means of dissolving everything into emptiness and then re-emerging as the divine form. That's, again, a method to be used to find out who you are. It's not a method for making money, for getting power over other people. It's not even basically a method for comfort and reassurance. It's a method of inquiry. That at the point when we dissolve into Padmasambhava, and there's nothing there, that is exactly the same moment as when we relax into the out-breath, or as some of us have done in previous times, done the three R's, open, just present, which means even if I'm not doing anything, something's going on. Then we can see the one who I take myself to be is part of the movement of energy. Everything I say about myself is a description of momentary energetic forms. What is the ground of my being? Nothing at all. What is the nature of my manifestation? An illusion like a rainbow in the sky. You can still enjoy a nice cut of cake. Nothing stops. What happens is that the dullness of anxious self-preoccupation, of endlessly going around in your mind trying to make sense of the world, and that you can release. The world is still here, but it's not the world as we know it. It's more, br more vibrant, more available, and it just tumbles on. And then you pop your clothes. <laughs> <laughs> and what happens then? Well, you pay your money and you take your choice. <coughs> we get all sorts of reports about what happens after death. These are all a matter of belief. How could you have definite knowledge? The main function of the ideas of what happens after death is that they provide a conversation about what happens in life. What will I do with my time? So, If my nature is open and empty, there is a great freedom to become many different things. So then the question, what will I become? So you could look back in our lives. When I was very anxious, was that helpful for me or others? No. When I was very depressed, was that helpful for me or others? No. 
when I was arrogant and self-indulgent and foolish, was that helpful for me or others? No. There are lots of ways of manifesting which are not particularly useful. If we are bound into these ways of manifestation without any choice, this is what's described as samsara. We just do them because we do them. Like Friday night, we're going to get pissed. Why are you getting pissed? Because it's Friday. What do you think? <laughs> Lots of people live in that world, didn't they? It's just, it is what you do. You do what you do. So it is football. That's true. Mm. Very true. Very true. Exclusively true. Mm. <laughs> 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 oh, that's Friday. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't apply to me, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but you're right in what you say. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So, so then, what, what, again and again, we have to observe what is this automatic, automated way of being that we succumb to. That, that there's a kind of ease and comfort, but very definitely, I would suggest, a kind of dullness that goes with just doing what we do. And the, the, the dissolving in Tantra, or the natural opening in Zongsheng, gives us a chance to think, what is the menu in front of me? What, what is the, the range of possibilities here? I can do something new. Why am I doing this? What is the function of this? And that opens up, in particular, the question of, shall I live for me, or shall I live for you? If I'm living for you, how do I need to be to be for the other? So, in the... In tantric tradition, they say that these three aspects, there's the Dharmakaya, the Sambhogakaya, and the Nirmanakaya. The Dharmakaya is the mind of the Buddha, which is infinitely clear and open like the blue sky. The Sambhogakaya is the potential of all the uh, capacities of the Buddha to manifest in different forms. And the Nirmanakaya is the specific form that the Buddha shows. And it says, the Dharmakaya is for yourself. And the form kaya, the Rupakaya, which includes these other two, is for others. That is to say, if you relax and open, this basic openness is enough, satisfied. You become at peace with yourself. So what will I do? I don't have to find some great world-shattering personal project inside me, if I'm connected with the world, other people will show me what to do. People have needs, people have desires. You have a chat with someone, you help someone with their shopping, you speak to a friend, you go and visit somebody who's in a hospice. There's many, many things to do if we are available. What else would we do with our time? Well, just today I feel just like curling up on the sofa and not doing anything. That's okay. That's you being compassionate towards yourself. If you do it every day, it starts to be a bit problematic. But sometimes the movement of compassion is for ourselves. Sometimes it's for others. When you take care of yourself, if you recognize that yourself is an energy in the world with others, it's no longer self-referential. It's like sharpening the knives in the kitchen or giving a good clean to the toilet. It's preparing for the next gesture. In all these ways, our Dharma practice is about being in the world with others while being at home in ourselves. These are not two oppositional categories. And the more we can practice in that way, I think it's very useful. So, <laughs> the function of coming to a Dharma center is not really to learn about Tibetan culture. Oh, that can be quite interesting. It's not really to learn about esoteric practices. It's really just to learn about ourselves and through learning about ourselves to learn about other people. And that includes frogs, snakes, dogs, insects, people in the heavens, people in the hells. Everything is open to our being with it. How will I know what to do? 
this is the basic social anxiety that we've probably all had in our lives. You, you know, you're going to go to a party and then you get a bit kind of wobbled. You think, I don't know anyone. What the, well, I don't like that. I'd rather stay at home. This is very, very important to remember that. Because that's the point where we feel between myself and the world, there is a threshold. Me in here, you guys out there. When we do the Padmasambhava practice or the relaxed open meditation, we realize there is no threshold. What I call myself and what I call other people or the world is the same field of experience. It's non-dual, undivided. And therefore, when I feel anxious that I wouldn't know what to do, what you've got is a retroflective flip. You turn back on yourself and you think, it's all up to me. But the great blessing of being part of the world is it couldn't possibly be all up to me. It's up to the situation. So if I go to a situation and if I don't have much to say and I feel a bit shy, that's what will happen. Oh, that would be too humiliating. Why? What's the prohibition on being a bit shy and being a bit of a nerd? Well, I couldn't bear it for other people to see me that way. Why? That is to say, I am not putting an arm around myself. I'm not saying to myself, sweetheart, you're all right. You're fine. Don't worry. And I'm whacking myself. I should be better than this. I should be able to do it. Oh, God, I hate myself. See, when you speak in that way, it's like a knife slicing into you, chopping yourself up into these different bits. If we can't integrate ourselves, how can we be integrated with the world? Loving oneself is not a narcissistic pursuit. It's simply to welcome and accept ourselves as we are. And through that, we welcome and accept other people as they are. And then there is no threshold, which means you can be sad. You can be lonely. You can turn up and be lonely and just say to your friends, I'm not much fun tonight, am I? They say, no, it's true, you're not. Why should you have to be fun? There's a, there you can see the internal dialogue in your head that says, I am only acceptable if I'm on the job, if I'm what other people want. The purpose of my life is to meet other people's expectations. I would suggest that's very wrong and that's not a Dharma idea. Our task is to meet other people as we are. Because if you are helpless, someone can help you. Your weakness is the opportunity for their strength. If you're always strong and always clear, you make other people useless, not needed on voyage. But we need other people. Everybody needs other people. People to help them do things they can't do themselves and don't have time to do. This is how we weave our world. So if we can see that every aspect of our life, our sickness, our foibles, our confusions, our strength, our generosity, all of that is a currency which brings us out into the world and brings about different meetings with different people. So that, that's the, essentially the, the basic function of the understanding of non-duality is to be at home in the world as we are, but recognizing what we are is always changing. Because if you can accept my sadness is real, that is to say present, it's not strongly real, but it's, it's manifesting, and it's impermanent. So if I'm sad today, if I can really allow myself to be sad today, it will dissolve. And then tomorrow I can be more happy and more generous. So somebody helps me on Sunday, and I help them on Tuesday. And you get the pulsation of interaction. So, as we come to the end of our time here, leaving of this place, whatever has been made sacred or special, you can just dissolve that into the movement of the mind.
The mind says this is special, the mind says this is ordinary. Truly, there is nothing special. The mind says it's good, the mind says it's bad, the mind says it's holy, Buddha center, shrine, the mind says it's a table with flowers on it, and there's some little paintings, and God knows what they are. You wouldn't get five bob for them, don't you? <laughs> That is a thought in someone else's head. Why not? The thought, why is the thought in our head that this is something holy and special better than the thought in their head? In that way we realize, I create this by my participation. And I can dissolve it. Why did we create it? As a useful support for practice. When we dissolve it, it's not to disrespect the practice. It's to say, don't put yourself out into the world too much. If you give your heart to someone else, they may trample it in the dust. That is to say, openness is not self-abandonment. When we say, this is important, this is special, it's a valuing which keeps us here and here, rather than ah. <sighs> because there are many lurking dangers in patriarchal Tibetan Buddhism. The power of hierarchy to cause people to project their own goodness into someone big and special and to take all the crap into themselves is very strong. And many people get lost in that. Everything is empty. No people are intrinsically better than any other people. The basic foundation of existence is the Buddha nature the natural purity of all beings. So maybe we could sit and do a little bit of practice, <clears throat> and then we can, for those who know, just do a little bit of prayer to allow the qualities of this building to dissolve back into the heart of Padmasambhava, and then we dedicate the merit of all the various activities that have happened in the center, and with that we come to the end. Gonzola, Masilehoo. <laughs> So, now we are in this little place. Uh, we don't know what the future will hold. In principle, I'm happy to come up north here. We need to work out when, how, and so forth. I will be doing this thing that some of you are aware of in crew. Primarily, it's looking at the nature of mindfulness practice in relation to psychotherapy, so it's primarily for people who are working as therapists, um, and to look at what's called uh, mindfulness-based cognitive uh, 
behavioral therapy in relation to more general Buddhist notions of therapy. But there are many opportunities to practice together. We all practice together whenever we sit and practice. We are not very far from each other in our hearts. Remembering each other with love and affection is the basis of the Sangha continuing. Even if we don't meet physically very often, sometimes we don't even meet at all, the connection is always there. And it's that belief which continues. That is our lineage. So I look around your lovely faces. I'm very happy to have been able to be here and spend some time with you this time and over the years. Thank you very, very much. Oh. James. And will you accept this? Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much for coming to Michael's field and giving us wonderful teachings and helping us to see ourselves more clearly with the changes happening. Welcome. And, uh, Good. I hope you come back very soon. Okay. Yes.